Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Tuesday Show. My name is James Chen. And my name is Ultra David, and we have a show that is going to consist not just of two people this time, but also a third. We're going to have a guest on that's going to be Keats uh, later on. We're going to be talking about Strive first, the beta, what we thought about it, our review, and so forth, as you can see in this handy-dandy description right up here up north. And we're also going to be talking about um, game development and some ideas with respect to new and beginning players. We'll be talking about the player bans that came down over the weekend, the situation that happened there, and uh, et cetera, related topics. Uh, we'll be talking about some cool viewer questions in the 5-5 matchup section. And then there's other fighting game news. Yep. And, uh, yeah, just, I mean, obviously a lot of people are probably wondering, you know, a lot of stuff that's been going on involving myself in terms of the player's ban and all that stuff like that. So, you know, I'll be talking about that once we get to that section. So if you're curious about that, uh, stick around for that. But, uh, yeah, I guess to start off, we're going to be talking about that topic over there. And you actually seem very small here. I'm going to zoom you in a little bit, David. Here. Oh, you know, I just I had a little bit of what Alice had in the first part of uh, Through the Looking Glass. Yeah, and that happens. I haven't, that... I haven't had the antidote version yet. So right. That happens. My bad. Sometimes. I just I came into this. You know, look, we're all at home. We're experimenting a little bit. Things are legal here in California that didn't used to be. I'm trying it out. I'm trying stuff <laughs> yeah. out. Right. You, you, you did the eat me, but you haven't done the drink me yet or something like exactly. that, basically. Whatever, whatever it was now. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So yeah, let's start by talking about Guilty Gear Strive's closed beta. It was over the weekend. If you had a code, then you can get in and play it. It was available through three stretches. You could play it against the computer for mm -hmm, the first mm -hmm. day, several hours. Uh, you could then play it on two consecutive days of playing uh, against other people in the online lobby system. Yes. Uh, there were all the announced characters except for Milia and Zato. Everybody else was playable. And if you had a PS4 in the code, then you could play it. Did you play it? Uh, I played it against the computer. I only got to play the online portion once. I planned to play it all the time, but one was in the middle of the night. The other one I had another obligation that I had to do, so I couldn't. But uh, I did play in the first one, so yeah. Are you telling me the middle of the night was off limits for you? Dude, this weekend I tried so hard to fix my sleep schedule. I am actually far more back to normal than I used to be. That's I, actually great to hear that. I mean, I'm, I'm back to about like 3 to 4 a.m. sleep, which is, uh, and like waking up at noon as opposed to... 7 a.m. to 2 p.m., <laughs> which I was, uh, it sounds I'm I'm glad, <laughs> which I was doing before. So uh, yeah, yeah. it's yeah. actually a market improvement this weekend. Okay, well that's good to hear. I did play it. I played it a bunch. I played it a bunch versus the CPU. Mm -hmm. Played a lot there. Um, and then the next day, our time Pacific time, um, I played it against the lobbies and online for probably a good three hours i would guess to me okay like okay that. yeah yeah. that's about and how then long. uh and then i did wake up early in the morning to play it on the final day so okay. i tend to get up at like seven ish mm -hmm. and our time it was going from 7 a.m and it was going to be closing at 8 a.m pacific time on sunday right. so i played it from about 7 a.m to 8 a.m right. that final day right and, you know, it's a kind of a tough situation because you haven't played a lot of Guilty Gear before, so you don't no. have a lot of frame of reference. This is a completely brand new experience for you. It's even hard. I mean, it's a fighting game, dude. Like, it, yeah. So so there's there's certainly uh, in some ways in which it's new. But in, like, a lot of the important ways, it's just a fighting game. So, I mean, I, it's not like I had zero experience with gear. I played XX in the arcades back in the day. Right, right. And I have certainly, like, seen plenty of people play it. It's not, like, an entirely new situation. Okay. So, okay. It's cer certainly I was no expert. I mean, you know, right. you just watch me play. I got the archives up on YouTube. I'm There's no expertise there. But <laughs> it is definitely a fighting game. And so, yeah, I mean, learning it, like, by the third day when I was playing that, that last hour of the beta, you know, I felt like I was, like, Learning and other people I was playing against were learning as well. Uh, I definitely noticed the progression for sure. That's cool. That's cool. I'm just saying that you're not going to come from the, the, the point where you're like, wow, this doesn't feel like Guilty Gear. I expect Guilty right. Gear to be this and blah, 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 you know, and all that stuff. That is, that's a different thing because 
obviously there's two very different audiences coming into this game. There's the people who have an expectation of what Guilty Gear is supposed to be and an expectation and no expectation or just a, so what is this Guilty Gear all about, you know, kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, and, up by heel punch. Yeah. And uh, what's interesting about... Well, you are somebody who has more experience with the game. I mean, you... you... I've been playing Guilty Gear certainly a lot more than I have since basically the series started. Right. Uh, so I played the first day and, uh, you know, I was messing against the computer. I tried out all the different characters to see how they felt. Uh, I mean, let's just get some of the obvious, you know, positives out of the way. The game is so beautiful. Oh, Holy yeah, crap. Like, Faust is amazing. Dude, his, his crouching slash animation is like one of the coolest things ever. Yeah, I, I, I think specifically Faust uh, 2 Slash is one of the coolest 2D fighting game animations uh, that I have seen <laughs> in this millennium. I mean, like, it's up there with some Darkstalkers buttons yeah, from back in the day. Mm -hmm. Like, it is remarkable. I mean, that's I saw that move, and the first time I saw that, I was like, okay... You know what, Arxis is the only one who can do Darkstalkers graphically. Like, I just, I feel like that. Right, that, right. I'm because, sure. I mean, it reminded me so much of QB, you know, where she injects yeah. the egg in you, and then you die, and then a new one comes out and stuff. So, that's yeah, all I Yeah, he molts thinking. out of his own butt. Yeah, he <laughs> does. <that> move. <laughs> it's awesome. Oh, man. But, uh... <laughs> Everyone says, uh, because I'm looking off to the, the, the computer screen to see you every once in a while, it looks like I'm not paying attention to you. <laughs> yeah, thanks for ignoring me. I came all the way over to your house today. I know, you're not right? Even looking at me. I'm just not even going to look at you, man. I'm not even going to look at you. No, but I mean, what's interesting is that, you know, I am approaching it from the uh, Guilty Gear. I love Guilty Gear. I, I have a preconceived notion of what Guilty Gear should kind of feel like. And um, I'm also the kind of person that's willing to accept games that are very different than their predecessors. In fact, in a lot of times, I kind of like resetting the, the, the legacy knowledge, you know, how we feel about the Street Fighter series in general and everything. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, I guess if you want me to go first on, like, impressions and, and, and go how for I, it, man. Let how, me hear it. how I felt about it was, um, you know, it was... <laughs> this is this is gonna not be a compliment here, but it reminded me a lot of PlayStation All Stars in a kind of weird way, in that uh, PlayStation All Stars was kind of fighting with itself to be hardcore and also very beginner friendly at the same time. It was like trying to be Smash, but like, look, these combos you can't escape. These are real combos, and you have to do this and everything, and. As I had told the the PlayStation All Stars developers, is that I felt like it wasn't targeting a specific audience, and uh, that's how I kind of feel about Guilty Gear Strive. I'm really not sure who they're making this for. <laughs> okay. Because it 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 feels like Guilty Gear. Don't get me wrong. Like a lot of aspects of it feel like Guilty Gear. Sure, the air dashes are different, but there's a lot of very cool new things you can do with the air dashes. Granted, both of us were playing Potemkin, so I know we didn't really get to experience that or experiment with that a lot. But there was the air dashes. You can change the distance now. Before in old Guilty Gears, you'd always air dash a fixed distance, no matter how early you hit the button oh. in your air dash. Okay. There was the air dash and defaultless defense cancel, which made it so that you drop super fast and like did like these little crazy things and stuff. But so it still felt like Guilty Gear, but at the same time, like there's so much of it that doesn't feel like Guilty Gear that people coming from Guilty Gear are going to be like, I don't like the way this feels. And then they took away like the Gatling system and made the Gatling system, I feel like, even more complicated than ever before. And so beginners are going to come in here and they're not even going to be sure how to do the Gatling because I think it's way more confusing. And, you know, it's, I don't know, like the game is kind of still crazy in a way. So I'm not sure that the game is particularly beginner friendly right now. I just feel like it's kind of in this weird middle spot that it's not quite, like it's it's trying so hard to be beginner friendly but trying to stay Guilty Gear that it is not maintaining its own identity it's having two sides fight on uh, on opposite ends kind of squashing the game in the middle basically and mm. i don't know i just I, I i i feel like they need to kind of 
uh, they need to commit to one side or the other because I, I think the way it is right now is it's in a very dangerous situation. Did I have fun? Yeah, but like I said, I was playing Potemkin. I was doing 60% damage on a pop buster and made me cackle every single time and I'd mm -hmm. get super heavenly Potemkin buster on someone and I just, I just start laughing. <laughs> and and I didn't have to worry about the Gatlings as much. I didn't have to worry about the air dash changes using this yeah. character. So, you know, I had a blast playing it, but at the same time I feel like I feel like there's something missing uh from it. I feel like there's a bit of an identity missing from it. And in that way I do feel like it is a lot like season one Street Fighter Five. Is that it just didn't doesn't have its own identity essentially. Hmm. Uh, what, okay. about, what about you? So, I ended up liking it, but that wasn't my initial position. I, throughout the first, like, day, well, two days, I guess, that I played it, I just wasn't sure, and I didn't think negatively of it. I just, I didn't have the, like, feeling of the draw, the hook, that, like, mm -hmm. makes me want to play the game again. I didn't feel like I made any decision that was, like, particularly interesting, and I didn't feel like the people I was playing against were doing that either. And, you know, I mean, I wasn't coming into this feeling like I knew too much about the series, like we had talked about. Mm -hmm. um, so throughout the time, I mean, you know, I was playing footsies to some degree. I mean, I understand mix-ups. Like, is this player going to do wake-up TP? Probably. Like, you know, <laughs> but the, the interesting decisions I didn't feel like I was making. I didn't feel like landing Pop Buster was, like, cool because it seemed stupidly cheap like <laughs> i could just get 50 percent damage immediately like i either either you're gonna jump away and uh i deal 50 percent damage because i hit you with you know two slash two h uh uh whatever the anti-air special move is called right. heat knuckle. Uh, or you stay still and and there's a command grab right? right i mean that's like not actually super interesting but as we were playing more, me and the other people that I was mm -hmm. getting faced up against, knowing more about it, I began to understand, I think, why some of the decisions were made. It's a very airborne game. I mean, it's a, mm -hmm. you can chicken block for no meter. Um, so everybody began jumping a lot by the end of things. Yeah. I was watching other footage that other people who are definitely more practiced than I am, uh, and they were doing a lot of that by the end of things as well. Um, let me make sure that my cord doesn't get catted. <laughs> And don't need another Kotaku article. <laughs> I do not. And that that became interesting because at that point, sort of understanding a little bit more, it became more difficult to land Pop Buster. Yeah. Because okay, okay. everybody was so airborne. And so I began to sort of understand, okay, I want to use Heat Knuckle because now it's plus on block, even if they air block it, now it's still my turn. Like mm. I you know, I began to start playing the game a little bit more. Uh, and it became more interesting and, and I did feel like I was making choices okay. that were cool. Okay. I did feel like the opponents were making choices that were cool. And so by the end, that last one hour that I played in the final morning, uh, I came away from that thinking a lot more positively. Okay. And thinking about the game afterward, and again, having watched more footage that other people have put out on YouTube and since, uh, since then, yeah, I've thought sort of more and more positively about it. Uh, I mean, my, my perspective as to whether the game is too changed is just something I'm not going to be able to, to bring in. Right. You know? um, it, it doesn't matter to me much... Anyway, I it's not something I've cared about for a long time with, with mm -hmm. the fighting games that I've played that have changed drastically uh, between iterations of the series. So I don't know that I would care about that anyway, but I certainly can't really speak to that. So my perspective is not like something feels too changed or too nerfed or, or anything like that. It's just that, yeah, I mean, this game seems like it has some fun ideas. Uh, I do like some of the direction to it. I kind of like the idea of playing an airborne game um, with... <laughs> you know, meterless, defensive, air blocking, that kind of stuff. Right. I think that's cool. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, by the end, I thought it was good. But By the way, I did also play Axel. And oh, you did? Okay, Axel, okay. I did play Axel. But that didn't last for too long because Axel, like, requires that you know stuff. Like, you have to know how to play the game. Oh, okay, to play okay, Axel, gotcha. Right? Uh, I mean, you got to know, like, what, like, which buttons are his anti-airs and what do you convert <laughs> anything into and where are you supposed to stand and move and what's the opponent's options. You have to, like, know the game. Whereas as Potemkin, I could just like do armor, and now I landed a grand right, grab. Right. right. I mean, it's just a, he's super easy in comparison. Well, I mean, everything that at, Potem at introductory level, everything that Potemkin did has been added to every grappler since Potemkin. <laughs> 
So, yeah, he's definitely a lot more common. His archetype exists in so many other games. Yeah, so. he's just a very, like, digestible character. Yeah. Uh, and so, yeah, I went back to Potemkin after a little while. But I think Axel is probably who I want to end up playing ultimately. Okay. Uh, I did try the air dashing, obviously, with him. And, yeah, I mean, I I like the mobility. I don't have anything to compare it to with right. respect to previous Guilty Gears, but I liked it. I thought it was cool. Yeah. And as for the graphics, the graphics, the animations are amazing. I would say that I think the lighting, especially in some of the stages that have lots of shadows, mm. is tough. Yeah. Um, I certainly didn't see some of the same animations. I mean, they were there, but like my ability to perceive them was yeah. definitely a step down in some of those levels where mm -hmm. there's just a lot of shade. There's one where there's like a wall in front of you and you can kind of see like a cathedral or something through it. Mm -hmm. And the person who starts on the right side just like begins the match in shadow. <laughs> yeah. And I don't know, I, it's like kind of a cool, it's cool graphics. Like it's a cool display of the graphic system's ability. Well, I don't know that it's like a good fighting game idea. Yeah. So I hope that they make things a little bit more apparent uh, yes. when they, you know, before the game comes out. Yeah, you can tell that basically they're just learning new tricks with their technology because obviously the way the characters were designed before, they had their own lighting source and they weren't hugely affected by the outside lighting and everything just to keep it with that 2D feel. And you can see that with Faust because Faust is always in a shadow regardless if he's standing in the light or not and everything. Yeah, but, his chest is always shadowed, yeah. Yeah, the one thing I will say that I agree with you though is that, you know, I, I commented that when I watched the Zato trailer how happy I was because Eddie looked so clear and like I could see what was going right. on. But... You know, now that I've discovered, and I don't know if this is an old age kind of thing or something like that, but it, it is getting harder for me to recognize what's happening a lot of the times. Huh. And in particular in Guilty Gear Strive, like, like half the time I could barely see what anybody was doing. But, you know, I feel like if I played the game more and I started recognizing yeah. things, but the zoom in was very big. The, the lighting, like you said, was kind of crazy. The other thing that was really weird to me is I... I, you know, the speed ramping. There's a lot of speed changes in this game where it's just like, slow down, speed up, slow down, speed up, slow wow. down, speed. Like, I just tried to do Heavenly Potemkin Buster into Roman Cancel, and the timing to Roman Cancel after that was, like, really bizarre. Oh, actually, just Pop Buster into yeah, uh, okay. Roman Cancel, and I was having trouble timing that properly oh. into Whiffed Mega Fist. That's all I was trying to do, and I had trouble timing it sometimes, so the speed ramping was kind of weird, but... You know, I mean, it makes it sound like I came away from it not too happy, but like I said, I enjoyed it. I think it's beautiful. And then, honestly, the, the my favorite thing about the game, with the speed ramping and with the graphics and with the wall effects and the and the slamming and the sticking and the giant counter hit and the zoom in on the cat, this game makes you feel good when you hit people. <laughs> Like, I actually felt really cool when I hit someone, even when someone hit me a lot of the times. I would just be like, oh, oh, you know? Like, I got that nice little visceral feeling. And like I said, I, I'm always an emotional kind of player. So those moments really worked for me. So I, I liked it. And yeah, the high damage, while it's bad for gameplay, I mean, it's like when you see it happen, you're just like, ah! You know, like, I, I, I would go kind of crazy about some of the high damage that I'd get off of people. Like, I just hit him with a Potemkin Buster, a Heavenly Potemkin Buster, and I'm like, oh, he's dead, he's dead, and he'd die, and I'd be like, yeah! But, you know, it, it's good for the emotion, visceral feel, but, again, that that isn't necessarily what the game should only focus on for helping the more technical players, the players who want the, like you said, the situations and the smart decisions and everything like that. Yeah. The high yeah, damage. I, I, didn't, I didn't have the feeling of, this is so cool, just doing, like, like basic three hit Potemkin combos that you didn't need any brains to do were 40% life. Right. And <laughs> that didn't, like, make me feel cool. <laughs> I, I specifically remember saying, that's so stupid, like, at least a dozen times. Um, because I just didn't see, like, why it should be like that. And I'm not sure that I expect the damage to stay how it is. Like, I saw two separate different ways to 100% chip. And, <laughs> you know, I mean, I gra like, granted, his life's supposed to be lower, but that seems pretty unreasonable and, like, not likely to stay. And, you know, I I'm sure that the bulk of the gameplay is, like, kind of designed, but values like damage and proration and that kind of stuff, so I'm sure susceptible to change still yeah so yeah. i don't i don't really expect that to be a big problem at the end of it 
Um, I mean, yeah, I mean, the, the decision making I thought was cooler and cooler as it went on. And as I've watched other footage put out, I watched the whole two hour thing where Nerd Josh played against a ton of top level players. Right. Uh, like Kugi and, and um, uh, I don't know, whatever. There was like half a dozen strong players using a bunch of different characters. And it was cool to watch. It was definitely cool to watch. I mean, again, I, I felt like there was a lot of cool stuff happening. I guess the reason why I didn't feel so bad about doing so much damage is because every time I got hit, I felt like I was taking a buttload of damage too. So it was well, you like, were, of course. Yeah. I mean, yeah, that's what the game was like, right? So, so there was there was one round where I played against his pot versus chip, and chip was running around doing who even knows what mix-ups and you know doing pretty good damage. I felt, mm -hmm. and I didn't have much life left, and I landed a pot buster. And then they tried to jump away, and I guessed on Heavenly Potemkin Buster. <laughs> that was actually the round. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's is that interesting? Do I like? Do I like care about that? I don't right. know. That just seems kind of stupid. Yeah. No, for sure. I mean, especially sure. because you know you can move after Heavenly Potemkin Buster. Right. They're not yeah, even yeah, stuck yeah. up in the sky. Like you can actually do stuff. I mean, I, I commented that you know definitely the damage needs to be toned down. Like that that yeah. that is not a question. I think that's. A yeah. universal everybody agrees on that one. It's it's a little too much uh, yeah. how it is. Or it just now, needs to default to three out of five rounds or something like that. I'm not sure because yeah. it feels very, you know, like Virtua Fighter-y. Bah, bah, ring out. You know, like, oh, okay, well, let's get to the next round kind of thing. But um, they, I feel like they definitely need to lower the damage. That was one of the things that I came away from it. So, But I, I do like the gameplay otherwise. I felt that we were beginning, being the players I was playing against, were beginning to use more of the system by the end, yeah. and I felt like there was good, a good set of mix-ups around that, and a good set of you know ability to move around the stage. Right. And, uh, yeah, I, so I I did end up liking the gameplay a lot <laughs> by the end, and now I'm looking forward to it more, which I didn't expect to feel. I mean, not that I expected to not feel that way, but I just I didn't really have expectations. Right. So yeah. now I I do I am looking forward to the next uh, chance to play it. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, like I said, I was having a good time. I was having fun with it, but the problem with it is, like I said, my biggest problem is I'm not sure who, who the game is for. Like, I think the older Gatlings were a lot more beginner-friendly. If you take that away yeah. and now make it the way it is now, then you're actually making it less beginner-friendly. So yeah. I, 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 I can't figure it out. You know what I mean? It's I, I'm not I mean, sure. You know, <laughs> like, I don't think that's real. Uh, well, I guess we'll talk about that more with Adam, but um, I mean, I still think that that's oh, right, largely right, right. not actually their, what their design philosophy is. I don't think they're actually trying to make it simple. Right. And and, and what it was was that, I mean, even, really. even Daisuke said in an interview, I think he even tried to clarify that not a lot of people have paid attention to was, yeah. you know, he was like, I'm not necessarily trying to make it easier. I'm just trying to make yeah. it so that the legacy players can't come in and just dominate like they did before. But see, at the same time, I don't agree with that because a lot of the things still kind of worked. They took away a lot of like the really cool faultless defense canceling with Faust and Chip and stuff like that, where you could change their jump momentum and mm -hmm. things like that. Uh, you know, uh, Hammerfall into Break into Pop Buster wasn't as fast, so you had to use the that special special RC special cancel thing to do that. Uh, so it well, cost you just you just let Hammerfall connect, right? Because it was only minus two. Oh, so okay, it just, okay. It was just a different set of mix-ups. I think instead of the call out being that you actually let Hammerfall hit, the call out is that you try to cancel it and they don't expect the cancel. Right, right so just, yeah, they yeah. Flip, they've mm -hmm. just flipped the script. Yeah, yeah. But uh, I don't know. I, I feel like, you know, it's the way that it's designed, it's not achieving, If even if that was the goal, even if it wasn't like, hey, I'm just trying to make this game easier for beginners and I'm trying yeah. to hurt legacy players, I don't think it's going to help that either. Let's just put it that way. So again, I just feel like what he's trying to do is not an achievable goal, not a realistic goal. Kind of like, you know, uh, almost in line with what you're saying, that there's really no such thing as a beginner-friendly fighting game kind of thing. Yeah. So, you know... Well, I'm not sure that I think that, but I, I don't think that that's their actual intent. With oh, okay, so. okay. Is that what you're saying? Okay, gotcha. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think there are some beginner-friendly fighting games mm -hmm. out there, but they're not games that I super care to play. Yeah. Uh, the lobbies. Okay, so the gameplay I ended up thinking is good. Mm -hmm. It sounds like you enjoyed it, although you're not super sure like who it's for. Right. The lobbies are a problem, right? Everybody <laughs> thinks this is true. The, the way that that stuff works online, trying to connect with people... Ugh. Not good. By the, by the last day, the last hour that I played, I guess they had made some changes, and I was able to connect very quickly with people, and I kind of knew who I was actually going to be playing against. 
but it was still not it's I'd rather a just have menus or B have the ability to walk up to somebody and like press a button or to walk to a set place like they have in mm -hmm. previous versions of this sort of cutesy lobby system where you just like walk to a spot and now it's your turn there right um, now I just it, it's like a not it's not an effective idea it's not efficient for sure and even as like a fun cutesy thing I'm not really sure that it holds up to what I want on that end either yeah the, you could tell I mean, my impression of it, well, one, I mean, not in terms of, like, uh, guessing here, but, like, in actuality first, uh, I, it just, it felt like they did, I mean, I don't know how they didn't expect this to happen, because they put out a tweet later on in the, in, during the beta that, yeah, if multiple people are standing on top of each other, it messes it up, because it doesn't know who to fight, and, you know, from a QA standpoint, I don't know how they didn't realize that unless whenever they tested it in their closed lab or whatever that they just did social distancing because they just knew that that's how it worked and there i mean it was clear that everybody trying to get a match would stand on top of each other and i, I put out a video on twitter where literally i had like 10 people standing on top of each other and as i walked past them you'd see the name just go brrr between all the names and i was like this is basically unusable like, this cannot be used at sure. all. So, like you said, when you challenge someone, they need to go grayed out. And, like, it needs to indicate that they are connecting. And now you can't interact with them anymore or anything like that. Or Oh, I mean, once once you know that they're connected, they, their little avatars begin to fight. Well, I, right. I just mean when they're trying to connect, yeah. they need to gray out. Sure. Like, that sure. needs to happen right away. <laughs> but, you know, it, I, I don't know if you knew this. I found out midway through. If you don't have your sword out uh -huh. you actually can walk to, up to somebody who has their sword out and press x uh -huh. and a menu comes up and it says do you want to challenge this player right, yeah but that's only if you don't have your sword out so if everybody's trying to make this work then everybody doesn't have their sword out which means that there's nobody to challenge because you can only challenge people who have their swords out yep. so you get into this like bizarre prisoner's <laughs> dilemma kind of situation of like who should have their sword out like right. what's optimal for the individual is not actually best for society and that didn't actually work out very well but by the end of the beta like i said i walked up to somebody we were just point blank and we just matched right it, it definitely happened faster by the yeah. end of things. i mean the thing is if it worked I feel like, I mean, a lot of people are really dogging on the lobby system right now. If it worked the way that it was intended to work, <laughs> I feel like that, you know, it might have actually been a little bit received a little bit more positively. Because the one thing that I did notice is there was the bartender on one floor. There was the person who let you change your outfit on one floor. There was yeah. an interesting balcony that was there for apparently no reason. There was also a sign that said Realtor out there mm -hmm. on the floor. And I don't know. I get this weird feeling that maybe at some point you once you, you're going to gain points. And like, again, this is all 100% conjecture. But like you could maybe buy a house and maybe from the balcony you can look at a neighborhood or something and you can see the house and you can decorate it or do all sorts of weird crazy things like that now that's kind of the hope because I get what yeah. they're trying to do they're trying to do something more than just the average lobby and I think it's kind of cool what they're trying to go for it's just you know what they're what they've implemented so far and how it works and everything like that is obviously very poorly done <laughs> And uh, while I would like to see a big revamp of the lobby system, I mean, even the problem of, hey, the better you get, you get stuck on the 10th floor. You can't even go down to any of the other floors anymore. That sucked. You know, like, that's kind of bad. I, I get the idea. You don't want good people going down and beating up on weak people, but... I mean, it's just supposed to be the ranked idea, like, right. the different ranks idea, I mean, that every fighting game has. But it's just not well done. Like, I, you know, I'm sure this happened to you. I was trying to play against some player, and one of us lost or won, and then we weren't able to match up again because we, one of us moved to the next lobby, or one of us moved up or down, right. and that meant that the player you were trying to just get games against because your connection worked, right. you were just like, all right, let's play this one. And see, you can I, do I, it anymore. I disagree. Definitely frustration. I disagree with Shankar. I don't. I I don't think that there's nothing cool about it, and if we just had nothing but menus and words, I think that. A lot of people don't realize how cold and unfriendly that is and how much that contributes to the lack of people actually being online and playing ranked. 
uh, this is something and one of the reasons why I'm really happy that we have Keats on here because I've been on this big crusade to try to figure out how to make fighting games friendlier and I feel like that this is a good start it's a good idea just implemented very poorly but like I we need to do stuff to make fighting games feel more like a community feel more like people like stuff that you can go and interact with and stuff by just having like lobbies yeah we're gonna need lobbies for sure private lobbies and everything like that but the way that fighting games work online right now i think are woefully inadequate and uh i really do think that again the first i mean what what was it friendster first came out and sucked is because myspace did it better and then facebook killed it like, I feel like that's basically just going to be what happened. We're going to have this shitty lobby here, and then they're going to figure something out. And then NRS is going to come and be like, no, that's a good idea, but we should do it like this. And then all of a sudden, you know, Injustice 3 is going to have, like, this amazing lobby system that's similar to it, but they just figured out how to Facebook it a lot better. You know what I mean? <laughs> so I, I just don't think that that's, that's not why anybody doesn't play fighting games, I think. I mean, I... I mean, for, for all the other game genres that I, that I played, you just menu in. You, you menu into League of Legends, you menu into Dota, you menu into mm -hmm. Overwatch, um, all, the, all the popular stuff. Yeah, is, I mean, you know, but a lot Starcraft, of... But, Warcraft are like that. Again, a lot of those games are already friend community focused, right? Only StarCraft is not. Only Warcraft 3 is not because they're 1v1. But a lot of those other games, like whenever I would go play League of Legends when we were playing with Super FX and all those guys uh, yeah. a long time ago, we would all already be on Skype and talking. We'd all be hanging out already. You know what I mean? Like that part is handled by nature of the game. Whereas fighting games, it, it's not handled in any well, way, shape or form. That's certainly how we dealt with it, and I never played it without friends. But a lot of the people who play those games are just going into solo queue and and just getting matched up with people. Mm. Um, Perhaps there's a lot of people who do that still. Uh, so I, I don't know. I mean, I'm those, not sure. I mean, I right, I, right. Maybe... So so here's the thing, right? So th those are the dedicated people. So people like us can go into fighting games and play the fighting games just like we do right now with menus and everything. Those of us who are dedicated to fighting games can do stuff like that. But, you know, in order to get into something as a beginner, as someone who's new to the thing, I feel like there needs to be something extra in there. And so that's where I understand what they're trying to go for. I think it's implemented badly, like I said. And yeah. I do think there is a way to implement it well. If I knew what it was, then then I, I will go and throw my resume to Keats and be like, hire me, and then I can do stuff. But... Unfortunately, I don't know what the answer is, right? <laughs> well, we'll talk, we'll talk with him in a bit, yeah. but uh, before we do, I just wanted to talk about the, the in-game UI and what you thought mm -hmm. about that. Uh, I personally actually, after, after having played it uh, for, I don't know, many hours, maybe a total of eight or nine hours, I think that it breamed pretty well, personally. I think that the UI actually breamed okay. Uh, mm -hmm. I didn't notice it for the most part. I didn't really... See, I didn't actually notice that the uh, camera changes during counter hit combos yeah. until after the beta was closed and somebody <laughs> sent me uh sage Amp's tweet where yeah. he was like what, what's the camera doing and i was like oh who, the camera changes i didn't right. even uh and the the numbers behind you i never noticed the big counter hit thing and the guy says counter in my ear so that was already enough for me i didn't really listen uh, to words okay, okay uh and then the little the info that moves i could do with that i just think that's not necessary i'd rather it be in the same spot yeah. but I also didn't have a problem knowing whether I had burst or whether the other guy did. Like okay, it was okay. yeah, without I even mean, thinking about it. By the end of my playing it, I was just aware of that. And yeah. again, I don't think that needs to be the case. I'd rather it sit still. But I actually think that the UI ended up breaming okay. Yeah, I, I didn't have uh, any problem with most of the UI except the moving the the picture, the portrait. I, I I'm still not really sure what the point of that was, but again, yeah. it's something that probably a lot of people don't realize. But I think it's something that Daisuke has been wrestling with for a very long time. And uh, I don't know if you remember, but in the old Guilty Gears, they literally copy and pasted your sprite, whatever it was doing, very tiny in the corner right, right. next to your bar. And I think Daisuke just has this weird fear that people don't know whose bar is 
belongs to which character and resource or something. And there must just be some weird tick that he has that he's trying to solve this ability to make sure you know exactly whose life bar is whose and stuff like that, you know? So I feel like that's why he's tied the burst and the risk to this moving okay. thing. But again, I could barely see the risk. I would always forget I have a burst because I'm used to seeing the big giant burst logo in the corner of the screen and everything. And I just think that there was probably a better way to do it than he did. Um, I even tried Photoshop mocking something up, like realistically, like a good compromise. Because most people who have Photoshopped a mock-up have just changed it back to the original. Okay. You know, and and I, I, I'm trying to find a way to to compromise with what he's going with for and to make it look nicer as well. Uh, the mock-up, just, I, I, I just didn't want to spend that much time on it because I started spending yeah. way too much time on it. And I was like, this is okay. not worth it. So, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I wouldn't either. Yeah. <laughs> so... Yeah, but uh, overall, like the combo counter. But then again, I mean, both of us are kind of known for not noticing a lot of crazy things. Like if you're Sanchez, Alex Sanchez, you know, Mech MacGyver, like do the numbers bleed in your eyes every time they pop into the screen, you know? Yeah, I mean, famously, that guy had to tell me that there was a table in Chun-Li's stage because I didn't know about it. Right. But <laughs> that was many years ago, and I have been really trying to be better about like okay. appreciating games as more like larger works than that since then so right. i've i tried to look at those things now and that's that's for why for example i brought up the lighting in that one stage right. that i do think was a little a couple mm -hmm. stages where it was a little off even the snow stage where like there's a blizzard and it kind of obscures the characters right. just very slightly yeah i could do without that stuff but when the yeah when the screen yelled the numbers at me or when it yelled the counter hit at me i mean it didn't it didn't bother yeah, me. Yeah. Uh, and the only reason that some of us saw a ton of counters and heard the counter thing a ton of times mm -hmm. is because we're terrible. And we're all just flinging things out there, not really knowing right. like what's going to come next. And plus another thing, too. If you is... know the game better, you're not going to have that many counters. It's not going to be like right. that. And, and remember how we all felt when we first saw the MVC3 trailers? I mean, they were the hit sparks were ridiculous. Yeah, I do remember like, that, These yeah. hit sparks are stupid. And then they never changed it. And now, like, when you place in, like, MVCI, you're like, God, I miss those hit sparks, <laughs> you know? And, uh, you know, uh, just to address, you know, what hi -Fi is saying is, yeah, that's exactly what I figured Daisuke is trying to do is you look at the portrait and now you know what all of your resources are, which doesn't make sense because the tension's still at the bottom of the screen. So that kind of blows that a little bit. And then, like Keith said in response, you're always looking at a different part of the screen now to, to see that information because it moves. And so... It could like, just be static, right? Yeah, like I, I said, I, I understand what Daisuke is trying to do, but, I, you know, I, I don't think he's doing it right. And I think, uh, like I said, he there's got to be a different way to do it. Put all the information in the corner and have the life bars maybe go you know, from center to out or something or, you know, some, or <laughs> hat, I don't know. What if there's got to be something, but what, what the, 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 the portrait method that he's doing right now, I don't think is the right answer. But again, I'm not mad that he's doing it. I'm glad that he's experimenting and thinking a, a little outside of the box and trying to be unconventional. It's just that the ideas that he's coming up with aren't working is is all this is where i'm standing at this point well so. i want it to be like world of warcraft where i can press a key and see all of my opponent's health right above <laughs> their head itself like i like the idea that keith just brought up the classic mmo thing where you can see exactly what's going on on the character itself yeah uh-huh just keep it still i mean on, on, even though i didn't think it was hard to follow just keep it still there's just no reason yeah. to, to move mm -hmm. it in my opinion yeah anyway all right Anything else to say in terms of initial impressions? Oh, who's the best character in the game? James? Who's Go. the best character in the game? Jesus. Tell me the tier list. <laughs> I barely... Who sucks, James? I barely played it, but uh, at first it seemed like, uh, from judging from a lot of the clips that I've seen, a lot of uh, like little higher level tricks that I see starting to be developed, I think Kai had a potential to be one of the best characters in the game right now, um, but that's all I got right now. I'm actually surprised you answered that question. I thought we were just going to move on to the next section and bring Adam in. But oh, okay. okay. <laughs> I thought you were just going to protest and we moved on. Uh, yeah, I, I, 
Kai seemed good to me. All the characters seemed good. Yeah, yeah, I, just, yeah. Yeah, the, I mean, I honestly, too, too one of I the could reason... say Potemkin seems like he's the easiest character. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Just, By far, he was the easiest. Just be but, a dingus about it. Uh, I mean, I felt like he was going to suffer from grappler syndrome that the longer we played, the, the worse he would get. Uh, but we'll see. That's that. That's just more based off history of fighting games than any sort of like, hey, I could totally see Potemkin's weaknesses. No, no, it's not yeah. that. It's not that. So. Well, uh, this is actually funny. Uh, Paco Stevens, uh, who works at NRS, of course, says that we've played around with health bars above character heads MMO style, and it didn't last long. Yeah. No, it wouldn't <laughs> I, work. I understand. It, it wouldn't work. It wouldn't yeah. work. So. But all right, you know what? Anything else to say here? Or are we moving on? Uh, the only one last thing that I have to say about initial impressions is that I want to know what Keats thinks of the initial impressions, and I have now popped him into the screen over here. Ah, say hello to everybody, Mister. I guess I should unmute, huh? What's that? Oh yeah, I unmuted. Go. Now I can speak. <laughs> there you well, go. Well, speak then. Hello. What's the question? I'm sorry. Uh, what was your thoughts of Guilty Gear Strive? So, uh, I mean, I'll echo what you said. I have no idea who the target audience is. Um, I think it's really important when you're making a game to choose the target audience. My buddy Get Dizzy Noah, he's a designer in Iron Galaxy. He always says a game for everyone is probably a game for no one. <laughs> and, uh, yep. you know... I think uh, you really have to sit down and and uh, you know make your pillars. I don't really love those that that process, but uh, a lot of times the reason you're making pillars for your game or choosing your target audience and really narrowing it down is so that you can filter a lot of your decisions through your pillars or through your target audience or both, and uh, make sure you're actually hitting who you want to hit. And uh, use a lot of focus testing as well to sanity okay. check yourself because you hey. do get way too close to this stuff. Hey, Adam. Is there any yeah. way you might be able to turn your volume up a little bit? People said you that you might be a little up. quiet. Uh, in Discord, you can just adjust my user volume. I'm trying to right-click it, and I, I'm getting nothing on my thing. My Discord has been acting really sure. weird recently. So. Uh, I can try. Oh, well, people are saying it's fine, so continue on. Continue on. I'm just going to raise okay. the volume overall of everybody. So. All right. There we go. Yeah, so how did I like it? Uh, the gameplay seemed fun when it worked um i was on it for about three hours and i got less than a dozen matches with my one friend who i was intending to play because he's local and it's delay based netcode in that demo so i didn't really mm -hmm. care to play anyone far away <laughs> and uh you know, the first night was super miserable we tried for about an hour we got maybe two or two and a half matches we've got four blue screens yes. um that was just me not between the two of us and uh you know, about an hour in, I said, hey, let's just go play Grand Blue. <laughs> so, <laughs> Abort! We, yeah, so we went and played Grand Blue for one hour, and we played 36 matches. Wow. So what a clip! Well, because Grand Blue has a rematch button. And, uh, you know, when I finish the match, I'm back in another match with no loading screens or lobby bullshit. And uh, am I allowed to curse on this show? Yes, yeah. absolutely. Good, because I'm going to curse a lot. I bet. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> So, uh, I had read the tweet after my Grand Blue session with my buddy Ken um, that they had done some sort of emergency patch and made it a little easier to match up with people and, and whatnot. So, the next day when the beta thing came around, I texted him and I said, let's try this again. He was stunned I wanted to try again. <laughs> so, he wasn't even ready. We got on there about a half hour later. We went to Russia this time. We went to Russia, Russia level 7 Whoa. to try and find each other. Uh, just try, we, like, we picked the region... That at that time of day, they had the least people awake. Okay, so that Dude, was like that 4 a.m. in Russia. See, that's like, fighting okay, game. The right region. That's fighting game mentality right there. Yeah. <laughs> we want the emptiest possible lobby so that we can stand on top of each other's avatars and touch swords. Which Dude, is I went just shit. just as a small anecdote. <laughs> I went to one lobby room one time and yeah. Maximilian was in there and I got the F out as fast as I could because <laughs> there was whole just, crews coming in, yeah. There was like seven hundred people trying to challenge him yeah. all at the same time, dude. It was crazy. So yeah, we tried to play for the next like two hours. We got less than a dozen matches. The ones that we did have had much worse connection quality than our matches in Grand Blue. Mm. Uh, lots more stuttering and freezing. Lots more delay. You're in Russia. Well, you <laughs> had to go through Siberia to play. I mean, obviously. No, it's peer to peer. That's not how it works. <laughs> Come on. Let me tell a joke. Let me tell a joke. All right, all right. Um, and yeah, just being forced back through the lobby 
like every time it kicked me out of the game, win or lose, we went back to the lobby and our characters were no longer aligned. So we start here, sorts, and then we come back to the lobby and it's like this. And I'm, yeah. I'm over here facing the wrong way and he's over here facing the wrong way. But the delay is like eight full seconds. So I'm like, Ken, don't move. I'll be the one who moves. And he has to hold perfectly still while I realign with him. And then I do. And it's his initializing match in the corner. But it doesn't say that on his screen. And then the worst... he actually never turned around and he's in the same spot on his screen. <laughs> so then I got to move back to where I was and then realign my sword with his sword. And now it says initializing on both screens. And what happens is eight minutes go by and only a minute and a half of that was gameplay. And right. I became physically angry and I had to turn it off. <laughs> yeah, because uh, also. I can tell one... that you're mad immediately because you didn't allow the joke at all. <laughs> you just wanted to keep <laughs> just... I mean, honestly. Yeah, like, you know, it, it was too frustrating to continue. And, so and the I worst just, thing is, you know, I told they... Ken, I'm, I'm out. When they kicked you out of a match, your sword would be. Like, you would have put away your sword. So, sometimes. Sometimes it was still out and I was in a different place. Oh, sometimes really? Sometimes it played a win or a loss animation, and sometimes it didn't. And sometimes it gave me the grade up thing, and then whenever it would grade me or Ken up, it would send us to a phantom lobby. So yeah. we'd go to Russia 7, but only us, only that one person was in it. It was me or Ken. <laughs> so then we'd both have to leave the lobby and rejoin it at the same time to make sure we got in the same copy of Russia 7, because if there's more than 36 people in Russia 7, Russia 7 2 appears, but Russia 7 2 is not selectable, and it doesn't even say 2 in it. It's another instance. It, mm. uh, I'm physically angry thinking about it. I can tell. <laughs> uh, none of that on paper like just makes any sense to right. me, and I'm surprised it got as far as it did, to be honest, and I really hope that they see the feedback and uh, just give me a, a nice text menu yeah. that let me Again, play it's, my friend. Again, it's that whole thing where I just look at it, and I'm like, I get what you're trying to do, but you know, this is why uh, whenever you try to do ideas like this, a lot of the times... It takes like multiple revisions before it actually works, yeah. and so here's actually the thing: like thing. fighting game players love dress up. They love it. Mm -hmm. This is something that we can prove through costume sales, blah 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 blah. Totally. But here's what they're missing: fighting game players want to dress up their character. Mm -hmm. They don't want to dress up their lobby avatar. They don't want to dress up their Hobbo Hotel pixel dude. They want to dress up their character. Mm -hmm. Nobody cares about unlocking accessories so that you can carry a broom with your little Hobbo Hotel guy. Nobody cares. I carried a broom. Are you attacking me? Yeah, I mean, that's You're cool that you design. selected a broom. But, like, you wouldn't actually like, sit there and grind so that you could put a broom in your avatar's hand. You Fart the zombie broom was carrying a broom. Could do it. He was carrying a broom because he killed a witch on the way to the match, and so that made his shirt bloody which made it all red. So his pants were red. Dead, is what you're red because of the blood from the witch. And then in addition, he hid her witch's hat in his very tall hair, which right. actually obscured the witch's hat. You can actually see that he had a hat on his head. Like, this stuff That's works. Like, <laughs> I play Neo 2 with uh, Heroic <laughs> Legacy. And he has lore for his character like that, but that's not his <laughs> lobby character. That's the character he plays as the whole time, and it's the ugliest character possible, and it canonically never bathes, so when you get to the bathhouse, you won't even use the bath to get the buff <laughs> that the bath awesome. gives you. He just won't that's do awesome. it. Hey, look, man, uh, I had I had my <laughs> purple trench coat, and I gave myself spandex so it looked like I had no pants. Gave myself gigantic shoes so it looked like I had slippers and put on gray hair. I mean, I looked like yeah. Hugh Hefner, dude. I was like walking around mm. in my smoke. And James, jacket. that's Guilty Gear. Yeah. <laughs> that's Guilty Gear. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. No, look, I, I, that's I why people love it. <laughs> yeah. I've wanted uh, to play I thought, a. I thought look, that if I could make Johnny article, look like Hugh Hefner. was perfect. Oh, yeah, it was brilliant. That last line was killer. It was a great, great <laughs> article for sure. No, it's, it's certainly unnecessary. I'm just. I don't know. Okay, so James, before we brought you on, was talking about the idea that maybe this could appeal to people who are coming into fighting games new, and that's what we want to chat with you about. Yeah. Yeah. So before before we one. get into this topic, the reason why is because you know, uh, look, I've talked with Keats a lot at uh, Combo Breaker and stuff, and you know, I love talking to him about video games and ideas, and he has a lot of very intelligent ideas on on how gaming works and everything. And I saw his tweet from uh, about four days ago where he says, when we talk about new players, a lot of context is missing. Are these players new to fighting games altogether? Are they playing against some new people? Now, now, now. Are these Fight players fighting life. game familiar but new to a series? Who are they playing against? Sometimes these discussions seems to insinuate that for a game to be newbie friendly, 
which could mean dozens of different things. Newer players should have a chance against experienced players. However, this is only ever the case if the game is not really worth playing. And, you know, so, like, I really wanted to talk about this because as someone who has made a fighting game before in Killer Instinct, you know, I really wanted to see, you know, nowadays with all of this, you know, ideas that everybody has about dumbing fighting games down and making them easier to play and all that stuff like that. Like, if you had to make a new fighting game, like, what would be the philosophy, a strategy, or is it just a complete fallacy kind of thing? Uh, There's a lot of questions. We've got to pick one to start. Sure, sorry. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the, uh, I mean, also, you know, just, just to cut this out of the discussion, some of the work has been done on this. Like, you know, we've been in now, pick the most simple right. possible fighting game, perhaps. And uh, we have games like Fantasy Strike and stuff out there, and those should conclusively prove to everyone that it doesn't matter how simple you make the game, if the game is worth playing, the expert player is going to 100 owe the newbie. <laughs> and that it is a fallacy to ever try to make a game in which new players have a chance against experienced players, because if they do, it's you're rolling dice. It's Mario Party, There's, and it's not worth investing your time into. Mm -hmm. If your time is not rewarded with experience that makes you better at it, you get bored and you stop playing it. It's that simple. Um, did David warp away? What happened? Oh, sorry. I'm trying to lower the volume of the of the notifications. I'm so here. I'm... Yeah, I just I did it as well. Oh, you did it. Okay. Oh, you did it. You did it. Oh, I haven't done it yeah. yet. I forgot that if I did that, I would block the window. Sorry about that. Sorry. Yeah, it's all good. I just did. Okay, cool. So, we, yeah, what what should I start with? Should I expand on the question of who who's playing, who who the new player is? Uh, well, let's put it. Th uh, yeah. Um. Yeah, go ahead. Just go start with that one. I mean, that's that's so that's like so. I see so many people talk about you know this is supposed to appeal to new players, blah blah blah. You can't say any of those things. I know it's hard on Twitter because of the character count, but you can't say any of those things with that little context. Because are you talking about people who are new to video games? Are you talking about people who are new to fighting games? Are you talking about people who are new to this particular series of fighting game? Are you talking about people who? Uh, are new to fighting games, but they've played other brawlers and beat 'em ups before? Are you talking about people who only play sports games? Or, I mean, who are you trying to get? And then who are they going to play against? Are they going to play against their friends who are of similar skill level? Are they going to play against more experienced people? Um, so when you're talking about, you know, is is this game newbie friendly? Were these decisions made for newbies? You have to load it with the context of who this newbie you're talking about is. This mythical person. Uh, are they in the target audience? And if they are. You know, you need to be more specific than that. Like, if I were making a game like Dive Kick, let's say, uh, the target audience would include people who have never played a fighting game before. Mm -hmm. It would probably not include people who have never played a video game before. Um, so there's a lot of decisions you could filter through one of those lenses that wouldn't make it through the other. Uh, so, I mean, as a game developer, though, how do you handle that situation? Because fighting games... I mean, obviously, this is a problem for every competitive game genre. Like, what is it about, let's say, like a League of Legends is doing right to have people, to have it appeal to all the different levels of, I've never played a video game, I've played video games, but never a MOBA, I've only played yeah. Dota, you know, etc. Uh, I mean, League of Legends has a huge leg up just from being one of the first successful free-to-play games. A lot of people got hooked way back when because it was free and you know <laughs> uh there's a lot to that question as well um fighting games we know this they're 1v1 uh it's 50 percent of your players lose every match and there's no one to blame but themselves it's uh it's really tough to get people to buy into that if you compare it to something like battle royale which can be intensely competitive you get eighth place you didn't kill anybody you just hid in the in the bushes the whole time you're better than 92 people. Look at you. You did it. <laughs> That's something to celebrate, right? Uh, it's not to me, but it is to a lot of people. It feels really good to them, and there's data that can prove all this stuff. And when you play League of Legends or Dota, you're not alone. You're on a team of five people, and those five people would like to win, so they are invested in your success. No one in a fighting game is invested in your success. 
I do not care if you ever win a single game, ever. And why should I ever help you win a single game? You're my opponent. Every single one of you are my opponents. There's very few people who are going to be out there trying to educate and grow opponents. Um, so it's just naturally stacked against itself by being 1v1. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, there's a certain type of person who's going to be able to tolerate that, and that's our community. <laughs> you know, it's there's there's a there's a growth limit to it. There's some people are never ever going to be able to tolerate just getting their butts kicked 1v1 for long enough to gain enough experience to really be able to feel like they're doing it. Okay. So, I guess then, if you were to make a new fighting game these days, uh, you have to start from scratch. Like, what would you do to make it so that it could appeal to the wide audiences? Or, like you said, yeah. if you try to appeal to everyone, you appeal to no one. Do you just say, screw it, and just try to appeal to a certain group and uh, just hope for the best kind of thing? Yeah, I mean, for me, it, the, the answer is absolutely to choose a target audience. I think you do that with every product you make, with every game you make. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just the right way to make a game that's going to appeal to somebody. You, you'd rather have 5% of the market than 0% of the market, right? Right. Um, and you see this in films, too. A lot of films that are focus tested to death and seem aimed at a very wide audience end up just feeling emotionless and flat. <laughs> and uh, you, you get the same thing out of games when they're focus tested to death. They, they have no vision. They don't speak to anyone. Um, so I, I think, uh, I mean, that, that's kind to, of what, uh, you know, the, the last star Wars film was, right. I mean, sure. Like, yeah. Yeah. You have to consider the fact that the $60 point of sale used to be all that mattered, right? If I could get you to buy a copy of street fighter two for your SNES, that was the end of my engagement with you. There was no way for you to go online and frustrate yourself. You could only play your friends. <laughs> and if one of them was better than you, you could just stop playing them, right? <laughs> the game's changed now. Now we uh, pay $60 for the game, and we know that that's only going to cover, you know, some because the audience is so small, it's only going to cover some part of our development costs and that we need to sell costumes and DLC. And because we need to sell costumes and DLC to make the game profitable, which is almost always true, we are super invested now in making sure that you continue to play. Right. So that point of sale at the $60 is just the beginning. I now have to care if you stop playing. That actually matters, because if you stop playing, you will not buy the 27th Chun-Li costume. And I really need you to buy the 27th Chun-Li costume. You're only going to wear one of them, but you're going to buy all 27 of them. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> uh, so that's really important. So how do we do that? Why are people bouncing off of these games? It's the 1v1 thing is not the entire part of the equation. I think there are a lot more people who are competitive who would be into these if these games allowed them to be into them. Mm -hmm. Why are they bouncing off? They are bouncing off mainly because of user experience, UX. Yes. Um, uh, one of the scales that you should tune any game on is fun versus frustration. And when your user experience is so frustrating that you spend eight minutes in menus for two minutes in matches, how do you expect people to stay? They won't. They will bounce right off of the product. Um, some games have made some nice strides in this. They will say, hey, you know, this matchmaking we've got, it sucks. It's slow. It's really bad. You're going to wait five, eight minutes for a match, but we're going to let you hang out in training mode while mm -hmm. you're waiting for a match. So you're improving on the game, you're testing situations, the time flies, right? That's a nice UX thing. That's really good. Uh, you don't want to sit there staring at the menu that's grinding this little spinner that says finding opponent forever, right? <laughs> so that's one thing you can do is to try and make these feel-good features that make people want to keep playing and keep investing. You want your matchmaking times to be as short as possible. How do you do it? Well, you need rollback netcode. You can't have short matchmaking times with delay-based netcode in fighting games because your pool of possible opponents is low. Mm -hmm. We already know not that many people buy and play these. I'll tell you for a fact... 10 million people have played Killer Instinct. That's Dang. a lot. Would you like to guess how many have ever gone online for a single match? <laughs> wow. Is it 10%? It's higher. Oh, okay. Yeah. It, it's less than 50%. Okay. Okay. 
Um, so you'd think fighting game one on one gotta go online and be the best and fight the rest. And uh, half of the people who buy these never go online a single time. Yeah. Why? It's not the UX stuff, right? They didn't even go online to find out that it was bad. <laughs> <laughs> the there's there's another factor here, right? There's a there's a embarrassment factor perhaps mm-hmm. where. You know, I got to go online with my gamer tag out there and I got to yep. put my ass on the line. And if somebody beats me, that might be embarrassing for me. And I might uh, I might appear on YouTube and I might not be I might be in some fail compilation and I might not <laughs> be able to live that down because of my fragile ego or whatever. I mean, it sounds silly, but that's a that's a real thing that keeps people from going online. Sure. Not, not not to interrupt you or anything like no, that, go ahead. but I, I've always said that. For some reason, when you play online, every time you lose, you feel like the person on the other end is laughing at you. I don't know. Like, you yeah. always feel like they're being a jerk. You and know that's... why? It's because when I beat the person on the other end, I'm laughing at them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I know they're laughing at me. Exactly. I'm laughing at them. Uh, I talk mad shit when I play online. I know. Me. I'm like, you dumbass. <laughs> Jump there, you stupid idiot. <laughs> See? You're the problem here. No, I'm just kidding. Uh... uh so yeah, that stuff's all really important. And you know, the next thing is how do you get people to buy these things? Marketing is failing right now. Mm-hmm. Why are fighting games cool? Well, if you look for the last 10 years of fighting games, the back of the box for all these things says it's cool because it's easy. Nobody <laughs> buys that. Nobody <laughs> reads the back of the box and goes, easy to play. I can't wait to get home <laughs> and, and master this in 10 minutes. Like that's not real. So the marketing really has to stop telling people it's simplified, it's easy to play. You should let the press sing the praises of your simplifications if you've made them properly. You shouldn't sing the praises of your own simplifications. You should be telling people, look at how cool this is. Look at how amazing that looked. Don't you want to do this to somebody? Right? Like if you look at our KI character reveal streams, we never talked about, it's so easy to do. Anyone could do it. (laughs) We said... Look, you get to do this double cross up and it's completely covered by this falling fireball that's gonna come back eight seconds later. You wanna make somebody really mad, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> and that got people hype and that sells. Uh, and that's a lesson that is being missed by a lot yeah. of I think the marketing departments. I what mean, is the appeal of a fighting game? Is it to learn the game fast and be the best instantly? Everybody knows that can't be done. If you could do that, the game would be shit and you wouldn't want to play it. Everyone would be the best instantly. What what kind of game is that? That'd be dumb. You're just rolling dice. I mean, what's interesting is that, I mean, I, for j- just as a little plug for our Patreon here, I just wrote kind of an article on there about, you know, dumbing games down and everything. And, you know, I feel like the goal should be to make the simple things enjoyable. You know, one of the examples yeah. I get is something like Falcon Punch, right? Like, mm-hmm. you hit B, Falcon! punch like feels amazing yeah if you're better than somebody else and they hit you with that falcon punch just through one random time they will never not talk about it for the rest of their life you know what exactly, i mean exactly yeah uh, I, <laughs> that actually does happen with my two younger brothers yeah right <laughs> they actually and so, do bring up the times they like hit me once yeah. there was there was like, the time uh, my dad played soul caliber with us once on the dreamcast <laughs> and uh didn't take it seriously at all we were no good at the game he picked voldo he played on the arcade stick the sega age tech green goblin with his feet wow. and he beat one of my wow. friends and he still talks about it <laughs> <laughs> so what am i awesome. there was one time in alpha 3 you know how like rolenzo could bounce on his pogo yeah uh, i did the bounce on the pogo and my friend did guys level 3 grab super which never grabs anybody and it grabbed me when i pogoed on the ground and I've never not heard the end of that one, like for the rest of my Those life. Those interactions are cool and you want that stuff. Yes, exactly. And I think that's what yeah. a lot of people are forgetting is not that yeah. they're, it's not to simplify the game, but to make it so that people feel good about landing things, you know. Well, that's part of, that's UX actually. Yes. I mean, mm-hmm. User experiences, all of that stuff. It's audio visual feedback. It's, you know, when I do TJ's power line in KI, ah, oh, it's juicy, man. It's got 20 <laughs> frames of hit stop. It feels great mm-hmm. to land that thing. <laughs> Um, and that's that's something you need throughout your game. You will also. I, I'd like to make a comparison between uh, like Tekken and Soul Calibur, where if I hop in, and I just smash some buttons, my character's gonna do some dope looking shit. Right. I'm gonna do some cool combos. I don't know what I'm pressing, but my character's spinning around doing some flip kicks. Looks looks sweet. Makes me want to play some more. Then I pick up Street Fighter and I mash them buttons, and my character's like, 
Right. Mm -hmm. And it looks stupid. And I look like I don't know what I'm doing. And I don't, so maybe that's what I should look like. But that's not a great user experience. Right. And if you want people to stick around, you got to give them a little taste up front. you got to get a little mm -hmm. bit so that they can see what it might be like if they got good. And Street Fighter does not give that to you. And yes. it has not maybe ever given that to you. I mean, the, uh -huh. the weirdest part to me is that I think the closest thing was when in Street Fighter 4 when people started mashing uppercuts. I mean, I just had a whole stream yeah. about yelling about uppercuts and, you know, hitting people. But that with... euphoria is gone. Like when, when Fireball was a secret move. Right, yeah. And you, you, you saw a Ryu player in the arcade accidentally throw a Fireball for the first mm -hmm. time and you both stopped playing and said, what the fuck was that? <laughs> that was crazy. And then you spent the next few months scouring magazines trying to figure out how to do it. Mm -hmm. And then you learned it and you taught everyone you knew how to do it so they'd know how to do it too because it was awesome. That's gone. Right. They've simplified the inputs. It's single button specials. It's not cool to throw a fireball anymore. Right. It's not. It doesn't give you that visceral mm -hmm. feeling, that memory anymore. It's, it's, that's gone. They can't rely on that anymore. Dude, you have I, to do more. I still feel good doing stand light kick into SPD and super turbo because it's just that much harder to do. Sure. Yeah. You know, I still get a, a, an emotional high every time I land that. And that's fair. Uh, so I think the next, after all that stuff, U, UX, low friction, low frustration, ensure your matchmaking is as good and as fast as possible. Uh, and it's not just about fast matchmaking. It's about making sure you're pairing people up with similarly skilled people. Mm -hmm. This is a really hard problem on launch day because you have zero data on the players. <laughs> what right. can we do about that? Nobody's really tried self-assessment. Could we try self-assessment? If the game loads, could it say, hey, Ultra David, are you a, a zero, one, two, three, four, or five level player? Right. Self-assess. Right. What would you give yourself, David? Four. You're going to be playing against other fours for the first week until we figure out what your real skill level is. Yeah. Simple, right? Nobody's really tried something like that. Some people are going to self-assess wrong. Some, it, some you know, uh, Dunning-Kruger idiot who has played fighting games for a total of five hours in his entire life is going to say he's a four. Yeah. And he's going to fight Ultra David, and it's going to be real sad. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but he chose that. So some of the agency is his, and it's kind of off of my shoulders, uh, you know, on the developer side. So that stuff's yeah, yeah. really important. And the low, the low friction stuff also includes tutorialization. Everybody's like, oh, man, the, the uh, uh, Undernight tutorial is just phenomenal. It's the best ever, right? And uh, it does let me skip to the later lessons, you know, if I, if I know the basics already of, of how a fighting game works. But that stuff, I have to go in and find out that it's going to yep. try and teach me, should I already know. Mm -hmm. That could be solved with a simple question, a self-assessment question. Hey, new player, are you new to fighting games or are you just new to Undernight? And if I select new to Undernight, I get to auto-skip a shit ton of lessons that are about how to walk and block and jump and <laughs> all that stuff that I really do not want to sit through loading screens to find out. Um, so low friction is the goal for UX. Yeah. Do not piss people off. They're already itching to leave. They're itching to not stay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so yes. uh, give, them, give them no reasons to leave. And then when you get to the actual gameplay, you can talk about things like low skill floor, which, you know, the Tekken and Soul Calibur mashy stuff is really good. That's kind of what inspired us to do the combo assist mode in KI, right. was to give people more fireworks for, for mashing. Um, high skill ceiling is incredibly important. Yes. People will not stay if they do not see a path to improvement and if they are not rewarded for their time invested. Does that mean you need technical one-frame links? No. Situational awareness could be a high-level skill. Right? There's a lot of things that can be high level skills, but there has to be a lot of it to learn. Mm -hmm. And there has to be a lot of situations in which the right answer is not blatantly obvious. Mm -hmm. um, and that's not an easy thing to make when you're also trying to have a low skill floor, but it has been done and it will continue to be done by thoughtful designers. Right. Uh, and it's important. So yeah, just do all that stuff. So it's Easy. super hard, but yeah, <laughs> that's right. what you got to do. And you know, if you ever are in a in a room with a publisher or somebody who's saying, make it so that the new player can have a chance against the experienced player, they're asking you to make a bad video game, right. and uh, yeah. you're gonna have to talk your way out of that, and it's gonna suck. So in in instances like with uh, Strive and a bunch of different games that have come out, where people who are involved in the project say things like that it's going to be more approachable or that it's going to be, you know, things are going to, it'll be easier for new players to get into. Do you think that those are real 
that they are really designing with that in mind, or is that typically, in your opinion, more like about misguided marketing? Uh, I think there are some things in Strive that clearly are meant for fighting in players who aren't Guilty Gear players to make onboarding easier, like having less character-specific combos and juggle weights and stuff is great. Uh, you know, simplifying some of the defensive options into Roman cancel and having this defensive Roman cancel. I think that's a really, I don't think it's executed quite right yet, but I think that's a really cool idea. Um, there's a lot of stuff in there that isn't going to bring the skill floor down, really. Uh, it could actually raise it in some cases, but it will take the amount of information you need to play at the skill floor and reduce it a bit when we're talking about Somebody who knows fighting games, who wants right. to come in and play against intermediate level Guilty Gear players. That's the new player we're discussing in this context. Right, right. Of I'm course. talking about somebody who's new to video games, or I'm talking about somebody who's oh, new to course. fighting games. <laughs> yeah. I'm talking about a guy who's played very little or no Guilty Gear, comes in, wants to play against an intermediate Guilty Gear player. That's it. And I think some of the decisions make sense there. And then there's stuff like James mentioned, the, the Gatling changes make total sense to me as a way to reduce degeneracy in combo paths to make sure right. you're not getting the exact same combo off of every touch, which is a problem we see in games like Guilty Gear and Marvel. Um, you know, like in Marvel, I hit a uh, any button. I hit you with anything in the air, on the ground, crouching, standing, doesn't matter. I get the same combo. <laughs> yeah. And uh, instead of doing... If I start with a light... I get 100% damage, but if I start with a heavy, I also get 100% damage. So he gives me, yeah. <laughs> yeah. right? Um, tr I think that I think that change was made to try to make it so that the options from different starters are visually different instead of just slightly different damage into the same setup mm -hmm. or whatever. Um, and on that note, I think it mostly works, but it is definitely the opposite of the rest of the changes. It is vastly. Uh, more complicated to explain to a new player mm -hmm. than just, hey, it goes, you know, PK slash heavy slash yep. dust. Yeah. And you do them in that order and you're good to go. Uh, this is way more complicated to explain. I actually saw a flow chart of how the new one works and I was like, yeah. I get it, but uh, <laughs> yeah. just, I mean, I gotta explain like five things to a new player instead of one. Right. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's tough. I, I get why they tried to do that. I think if I was making a new fighting game, I would also try to find ways to differentiate what you get off of light starters versus heavy starters so that the risk and rewards make more sense. But mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if that's the direction I'd go or if that direction is going to work out for them long term. And like I said, I've only played like 12 matches and watched maybe an hour or so more online. So right. some of my opinions could be off on whether or not that it's working either. Okay. All right. Um... What do you got, James? What were some of the other questions I had there? Because you've kind of covered a lot of them. Just I think he did. By default yeah. over yeah. here. Um, but, I, mean, do you... I have some other notes if you want me to jump into them. Just um, chat. Yeah. yeah. Um... I mean, what what would be an example? Because for me, uh, I've, I've always kind of argued this. I, I don't know if you agree and feel kind of the same way that I do about this. But, you know, I've always felt like, especially more of the earlier Smash Brothers games as being some of the best examples of having that kind of beginner friendliness, but the high level ceiling like melee kind of things, you know, and I really do feel like that's a good prototypical example of a game that's beginner friendly and still has the high ceiling. Uh, what are your favorite fighting games that kind of fall into that category that kind of exemplify that to you? Uh, definitely not melee. Uh, it's uh, <laughs> melee is a game in which I can press left and I have no idea what's about to happen. Mm -hmm. Is my character going to turn around? Is he going to run left really fast? Is he going to walk? I don't know. Mm -hmm. It's an analog stick and it sucks. Right. Um, I've always struggled with Smash controls just from their analog nature. They're extremely touchy. There's mm -hmm. a lot of overlapping inputs. I do not find Smash to be user friendly at all. Uh, I get that if you're playing with a bunch of people who also don't know how to play, there's some big hits. But it's the only fighting game I've ever played where you can just press left and die. You can just walk <laughs> off the stage and be dead. That's not user friendly. It's not. So, uh, and in melee specifically, even grabbing the ledge was kind of touchy. Right. So uh, yeah, I, I don't think Smash is particularly user friendly. The newer ones are much more user friendly. Right. Of course. But uh, I have always struggled with the analog input uh, myself, and the fact that you can just suicide is always not a very friendly idea. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think things like Tekken, Soul Calibur, KI, things where you can mash and see something cool happen is always going to be okay. user-friendly. 
Um, yeah, I, I think clarity is really important. I think you want to avoid using a lot of tricks to make players feel like things were close. Like, uh, I think the guts. I think guts systems are usually not great. I, I don't like uh, guts. that obscures information about the game state and how much damage is left and yeah. how much has been dealt. And I mean, it's designed to make the match look closer. That's all it's for, is so that when I'm at 10% and David's at 40%, it looks like I'm at 15 and David's at 25 and that's just not what is actually happening mm -hmm. um so that i can lose and be like but i was so close i'll get him next time but you're you're being lied to and <laughs> i don't think that actually helps people learn hmm. um so i mean I how think, do you balance that though i mean obviously with yeah. a lot of new fighting games these days they've all got that a a a, -A auto combo now right mm -hmm. unist uniclair has it Dragon Ball has it, BB Tag has Will it. Will that become like the Fireball, where people just expect it and it's not cool anymore? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so for Maybe. something like Soul Calibur and Tekken, where you can mash and cool things happen, etc., how do you make sure that that's not strong? Or like in KI, what was your system to make sure that that wasn't weaker than actually knowing what you're doing and manually inputting special moves? And, and well, KI is like weird because the easiest combo in the game is the hardest hitting combo in the game by design because it's also the easiest to break mm -hmm. so we have a huge mm -hmm. leg up in designing a system like that because we say hey the easiest combo in the game just got easier but it's still just as easy to break and it doesn't actually matter or change anything about your decision making uh, and it's actually pretty obvious when somebody's on combo assist and doesn't know how to play because they are flailing in their combos and doing the same type of auto double mm -hmm. uh, special loop over and over which makes them even easier to break. Uh, and I, I saw somebody on Twitter, I forget who it was, say that when you send people back to neutral more often, that favors the weaker player, and that is just not true. The hmm. intermediate player isn't going to have a better chance to win because he's in neutral more often with the stronger player. That's just okay. not how it works. Well, uh, if, you, if I may interject, because uh, I kind of have stated something very similar that I feel like uh, when you set people back to neutral, I don't think it necessarily favors the newer player. It just fools them into thinking that they're playing more. <laughs> they get to play again, yeah. Yeah, because... Maybe. Uh, I, I find that most intermediate players live and die on... Uh, setups. Yeah, set play. I, I always and hear they actually really don't want to be a neutral at all. Like there was one <laughs> point in time when uh, Tekken 7 was a little bit newer that a lot of people would play the game and they would be like, I like playing Tekken 7 because I know why I died in that game. And you know, sure. you know 100% they have no idea why they died. And I just feel like it's just because they got up and were able to play neutral again. The other guy was still destroying them. But it felt like they were doing something, whereas opposed to yeah. something like Street Fighter Five, you get knocked down, you never get up, and you just basically get right. murdered, and you just feel yeah, like... Yeah, I mean, Oki's actually a huge problem for the entire genre, is you yes. feel like you get pinned down and you don't get to play. So mm -hmm. should a game completely remove Oki so that people can feel like they get to play? Well, the answer is that that's probably impossible. You have a game with discrete, you know, you're in control, you're not in control states, like hits done, blocks done... And people will find a way to pin you down and make you very sad that you didn't get to play. Uh, right. If you make the knockdown shorter, people will find a way to exploit that. If you make them longer, people will find a way to exploit that. Um, it's a really complicated problem. Tekken has actually fairly complicated Oki that is really intimidating for a new player and very hard to overcome. That's a big learning bump. Mm -hmm. Whereas most of Tekken is pretty easy to get into. That part of Tekken is actually quite off-putting for new players. Um, and that's why in Tekken 7, they just made it so that now you can just hold back and get away from most things. Right. That It's right. rare to have a character that can relaunch you off of that compared to other fighting games, to other Tekkens, I should say. Yeah, yeah. And that's a problem that peop, you know designers should keep chipping away at, mm -hmm. probably. Um, there are a lot of people out there who will be like, no, I love Pressure, I love Oki, I love all this yeah. stuff, and you know. Right. It also needs a place, you know. I mean, Look at KI. KI is filled with the most oppressive pressure, and, AP, <laughs> and we can get away with it because the breaker system yeah. is what gets you back to neutral, not escaping the Oki necessarily. Well, let me ask you this um, question. I've often said that I feel like one of the reasons why Tekken 7 is more popular now is because people mm -hmm. can get up off the floor a little bit easier than before. Kind of like sure a that plays a part of it. You do. You you agree, or I I miss yeah. that. Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. I, I think I think that that definitely plays a part in getting people past the initial hump of 
you know, how do I reach the skill floor? I need to know the minimum amount to yeah. be able to play. I mean, again, I, I'm talking about fighting game players who are new to Tekken. I'm not talking about people who are new right. to fighting games. I mean, I feel like um, that's one of the reasons why Street Fighter 4 is still so popular because Uppercut, FADC, and Invincible Backdashes, I mean, you saw at the lowest levels, people would just Invincible Backdash on Wake Up all the time because it, yeah. it got them back to the neutral. Invincible Backdash is a, is a good thing. Yeah. KI's got it. Uh, mm -hmm. A lot of my favorite games have it. If your opponent makes a hard read, they get to mess you up. And if they don't, then you tend to get out and you're back to neutral where you'll probably lose again if you're the worst player. Yes, so, mm -hmm. exactly. Um, exactly. That's all good. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> yeah. Um, I think another thing you can do that really helps players stick, I don't know if this will be a controversial one or not, but I think this one's really important to me, is, you know, I said your game should have a target audience. Mm -hmm. So should your characters. Okay. <laughs> yes. Every single character you make should have a target audience. Oh, God. I've made characters that are specifically for Ultra David. Yeah. Yes. You know? <laughs> yes. Like, I've had him in my brain when I sat down with my team to say, mm. this is a character that Ultra David would lose his mind about. Yeah. It doesn't matter if this character is the weakest character in the game. He's going to really like it, and he's going to play it anyway. Mm -hmm. So when you see a top eight for a game like Street Fighter V, I'm going to pick on Street Fighter V Season 1 a little bit. Yeah. And it's got, you know, three camis, two Nashes, and a couple other characters. The reason that happens is not actually a balance issue, because I actually don't think that balance in the traditional sense matters. Mm-hmm. Um, balance in the traditional sense being you're trying to balance for equality where your idea of balance is that all characters have an even shot to win um, if you tune that direction what will happen is you will start to see play styles come together so you'll have less viable play styles in the game because of the need for equality and then you'll start to see players favoring the characters who are one of two things either the easiest because all things are equal, why would I play a hard character if it's the same strength as an easy character? There's no good answer there. Or the, go to the coolest characters. Cammy looks cool as shit. I'm going to play her. So you end up with this homogeny in character selection and tournament because the game has one and a half or two total play styles that are viable. Yep. And there's two characters who are easier or cooler than the other ones. Yeah. Maybe they're better than the other ones, too. But it doesn't really matter. If you make a game, I'm going to use KI. If you make a game like KI, it's deliberately not balanced for quality. <laughs> Arya is purposely a better character than the other characters. Because she carries a higher risk than the other characters. Mm -hmm. If Arya was the same strength as Jago, no one would play Arya seriously. Yeah. Because it would not be worth your time invested in a character that complicated she has to be better. She just does. Mira is a character that drains her own health to fight you. She has to be one of the best characters in the game. If she's not, no one will play her. Mm -hmm. Characters who uh, are really frustrating to fight against, who might make people quit the game, like Aganos. That character has to be weaker on purpose. Yes. Yes. If he was as strong as Jago, no one would be playing KI today. Because Aganos would make them all quit because that character sucks to fight. <laughs> and there are like two or three really good Aganos players out there today. And when you fight them, you're going to be like, God, I hate this. This sucks. <laughs> and that's why we purposely tuned that character God. towards the bottom. Yeah. Uh, I, I always and he say... still wins tournaments. But yeah. it's not because we tuned him to be equal. It's because player personality is shining through. Yes. Top eight variety is because of player personality. It's not because of balance. Mm -hmm. It has been... nothing to do with equality. The, the, the game is definitely also reasonably well balanced it, for equality. There, uh, I don't, I don't, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, uh, I just There's don't some... want you to sell yourself short on that because well, it, so it, it is actually pretty good on that. The, the, the scale I tune there is risk versus reward. And again, that's a question you should be asking yourself on every decision you make. Um, and it's, it's like, okay, maybe a jab is low risk, but it has medium reward. Is that bad? It should be low risk or reward? No, that's not bad as long as it is consistent throughout the game. Yeah. If all characters get low risk, medium reward off jab, that's a balanced thing. If a character does not, then you have to justify why, right? right? So, like, 
maybe a character like uh, Conra gets away, or, or Arbiter is a better example. Arbiter gets way less off of his jabs than other characters. That's that would not be a balanced decision unless I could justify it by saying, well, Arbiter can do all these other things yeah. that require a weakness, you know. Right. Um, and like I said, with like Arya and Mira, their risk is higher. Their reward has to be higher. Right. Uh, I think if you just holistically look at your game in terms of that, things end up in a decent place, and you really only have to worry about extreme outliers. Like uh, early on, Sidira versus Agnos was like a nine-one for Sidira. <laughs> so then you got to do something. But most of the time, if you just make the risk and reward actually make sense in the context of the game. Yeah. Most of this works itself out as long as your characters are aiming at different target audiences. Yeah. You're going to see the diversity you want out of your game. People are tuning towards balance because they want diversity. Let's make no mistake about that. They don't actually want the characters to be equal. They want to see a variety of characters when right. they look at the game. That's yeah. why they're tuning that direction. They will not get it by making the game equal. Right. They will get the opposite. We've seen it almost every time. They make it worse you get less character variety in yeah. most cases. I mean, for um, me... If you and if you give the characters different target audiences, I mean, look at a Guilty Gear top 8 for Exert. There's a huge variety there, and that game is not particularly known for good balance. Elfelt's a monster, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But the character personalities are so all over the place and really aimed at different people. The personalities have to shine through. People become so addicted to the type of game plan that they want to they wanna do. And they're going to pick the character that lets them do it. Um, you know, there are people out there who are just going to play Venom for their entire lives. And that's a complicated character, and it's not for many people. But you see that in a top eight, and it's just like, this is awesome. <laughs> um, Grr, peppery slash. <laughs> yeah, so you want to make characters as powerful and as fun as you yeah. possibly can without breaking the frustration line that makes people quit. Yeah. So, I mean, I that's mean, it. Just it's... do that. Although although I do believe Street Fighter V's gotten better at it during the course of the five seasons that we've had, you know, it's always been my complaint. You know, that's why I'm yeah. so, you know, arguing for give some people invincible uppercuts. Make somebody yeah. have a safe sweep. Why not? I'm going to argue that they still don't get it, but that they've added more play styles to the game that are valid mm -hmm. yeah. that weren't there in seasons one and two. Yeah. And that is why the variety got better. Yes. The variety got better because player personalities get to shine through yes, now. Definitely. And in seasons one and two, there were, like I said, one and a half or two valid play yep. styles. And the people who were winning with those play styles were picking the easiest or strongest characters. Yep. Um, and now you have, I don't know, there's like five or six valid play styles. There's some more interesting characters in the game. So yeah, for sure. you see a lot better variety. So I don't know. I just I, this is my experience. I could be wrong on this stuff, but I the more I work on this stuff, the more I feel like balancing for equality is a fool's errand and actually usually gets you the opposite of the result you want. And uh, you should be looking to I call it balancing for harmony. That's what you want to do. <laughs> I know it's silly. No, I love but, it. Uh, it's you want to create a harmonious game state <laughs> in which a lot of like, players can find their fun you because sound like we're not Gil all looking here. for the same fun. Um, and that's how you get the variety you're looking for. Yeah. Sweet. It's so like I said, you sound like you sound like your gil, the gill of fighting game developers now. <laughs> I balance for harmony. Yes. <laughs> Become a part of me. That's stuff I know. Oh, uh, but yeah, I, I think that's really important. I think I think fighting game developers really need to think about target audiences for characters more. Mm -hmm. um, and and you know, I'll see whole games still coming out. Uh, I, I think Tekken is kind of guilty of this too. Yeah. Most of those characters seem like they're for the same person. Yeah. They're really very similar in play style. Uh, there, I mean, there's lots of nuance, right? But uh, there's only a handful of valid play styles in Tekken. And if you love Tekken and you love that play style, that's awesome. But uh, there's there's a limited uh, uh, reach to that kind of thing, right? I mean, that, that's the biggest reason that I uh, have not picked that game up. Um, and to the extent that I were going to play a 3D game or a Namco game, it would be Caliber because I feel like there's there is a character that does what I want to do, and yeah. there are characters that do the opposite of that. And the yeah. difference of play styles is to me really uh, important. Yeah, I think Soul Calibur is a total success in terms of having yeah. characters that seem like they're aimed at different audiences. I mean, this uh, is it's one of the reasons. It's one of the main reasons why. I praise Street Fighter 4 so much. Well, there is a problem of having too many grapplers and stuff, but I do feel like that game did a decent job. Like, 
you know, there are the Marn and Punko characters in the game. There are the Filipino champ characters in the game. There are yeah. the, you know, the different the Snake Eyes kind of characters. In and the those game. aren't even play styles. Those are people. Right, exactly. And, and there exactly. are people who play those same characters for different reasons, and they can be part of your target audience. Mm-hmm. 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 And that's what I've always said. That's why in Street Fighter V, I was glad when they added Manat, because she yeah, becomes an execution for sure. junkie for someone like Sako, you know? Mm-hmm. Like, I, I just felt like that that like being able to create characters for for to satisfy all the different styles is so important yeah adding a character that feels like a breath of fresh air because it's something the game was desperately missing is is not something that should need to happen the game shouldn't be missing core play styles from the beginning Mm -hmm. those should be part of your day one design or your season one design is as best as possible Mm -hmm. to cover as wide of a group of uh people as you can <laughs> i mean david Makes and I, I was about to say david and i have always said imagine if street fighter 4 like season 4 was the first season that came out man. <laughs> it would have been better received yeah oh sf5 yeah yeah, yeah. yeah for sure for sure sorry what were and, you saying uh, David? yeah we would have skipped the whole rootkit thing yeah. so that's cool. that would have been nice as well <laughs> <laughs> too silly too silly well, look, uh, we've had you here for quite a while now. Is there anything else that you'd like to talk about? Um, open-ended, guess. whatever. What do you yeah, want to talk open-ended. about? Open-ended. Uh, no, I, I think I got through most of my notes. Okay. Uh, well, so what, what new yeah, project are you about to announce live in front of the world for the first time at Ultra 10 TV? Uh, you'll be sad to hear that neither of the two projects I'm working on are fighting games. Oh. They are competitive, but they are not fighting games. And uh, I am absolutely in love with both of them, and I, I hope they can find their way to market because I think that they're really special. But uh, for now, they stay in the dark. Okay, no problem. But yeah. uh, sounds good, man. My final plea here is like I, I, I kind of already made the, the the play for it a little bit earlier, but you know, if you ever need, if you ever do make another fighting game and you want someone to help combat design, you know, just let me know. <laughs> <laughs> well, do I do want to make more fighting games? That is something I want to do. I uh, I got some ideas for a dive kick sequel. I would love to do a One Piece or a Marvel fighting game. I think uh, I could knock those out of the park. Nice, awesome. Yeah. Well, I hope you're staying safe and everything's going all right. Otherwise, yep, staying inside, having groceries delivered, and oh, nice. washing my hands a lot. So cool, cool. I like your house back there. You got a nice, you got nice wallpaper. Mm-hmm. It's not a not a large place, but it looks nice. Yeah, this is the whole thing. <laughs> That's the whole thing. Yeah. <laughs> oh man. Now the house is messy, so I pulled my show you screens from my windows and moved them behind me, so you oh, couldn't dang. see the horrible mess behind me. Dang, that's a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. But uh, no, yeah, thank, I appreciate thank... you having me on. It was really fun, and oh, yeah, dude. Uh, no, I hope th- people, for... you know, even if you don't agree with what I said, I think it's it's a cool discussion to have. Yeah. Yeah. Um. And I think uh, players and commentators can actually be a lot better about how they think about game balance as well yeah. and how we present it to impressionable people and how we discuss it. And uh, maybe some of the thoughts I shared here will inspire some yeah. some bettering in that area. Sounds great. Cool. Th- no, honestly, thank you for yeah, coming I mean, It was here. very interesting. Uh, like I said, I, I always like talking to you about your ideas with the way games are designed and stuff. So it's always a fascinating discussion. So really thankful that you had time to come on here. So Nothing but time, man. I'm trapped in my house. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was going to say. Wow. How generous. Yeah. <laughs> your limited time. To, uh... no, you know. Know. Time is yours. He could be learning his know. new skill right now, because if you're not, you're obviously wasting your time in quarantine. You know. Yeah, I also learned that I fidget a lot, so it's better to exercise than fidget. So I got one of these resistance bands. It's actually... Look, that's exactly why I was messing <laughs> with this hand gel putty for most of this uh, talk that we had. Yeah, get on. resistance bands. You can get strong instead of whatever while you're fidgeting. I'm a... Dude, I now I, I feel like a good. lazy bum here, because I didn't have any sort of like <laughs> fidgety, exercisey thing. Man. <laughs> all right well let's get moving sure Rules, guys thanks again all right have a good night. thank you very much Bye. have a good night okay cool uh, now i need to adjust the window to the new window shape here
because that is... Oh, don't mind me. I'm just phasing through. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Let's take a break, and I'll get you back on here real quick, so... You got it. All right, cool. We'll be right back, guys. You guys couldn't see it over here, but David was giving his kitty a little kiss. Turned it down now. You guys can let me know if it sounds about right or not. All I see is David's cat walking around his desk. Hope the cat doesn't chew any wires or anything like that. fighting games from now on I think I'm just going to uh, I think I'm just going to get Keats to get on the show and do all my talking for me to be honest with you he articulates everything that I want to say so much better than I can ever try every time I try to explain something it comes off way too emotional and angry and stuff and I can never explain it that well Shoutouts to Keats there. I mean, I've, I've talked about it before, a long, long time ago, about making sure that characters that make people quit have to be skewed a little bit weaker, you know, these things like that. You know, I've talked about these things a lot, but I'm always so awful at, at putting it in a way because I get so damn emotional about everything. I'm so bad at just, like, calmly explaining it like that. I definitely appreciate him helping with that. I think we're good to go. Once David sits down, this should look fine. Yeah, Keats definitely needs to jump on the jam sessions that uh, that Say Jam does. I think that would be a really, really good pairing. Yeah, but you know, Keats, you know you and I have slept together in the same bed, so I think we'll always have that, so. It's true. Keats will not deny this, dude. He knows that this is true. <laughs> That's right. We slept in the same bed at Tom Cannon's house. <laughs> the, 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 the kind of uh, interesting things that Tom Cannon is into that he needs to put on websites, you know? <laughs> Got me and Keats into the same bed, dude. <laughs> uh, the name of the music is listed up at the top of the screen. It is the it is a chill version of uh, the Undernight in Birth character select music by Akito Loves Music. You can download download that at the uh, link that you see up there at SoundCloud.com/slash. Akita Loves Music 2. 
a uh, player here in SoCal, has played a lot of Grand Blue Fantasy Versus as well. I met him at the Grand Blue Fantasy Versus launch event after I used this music, because I asked him too. I was like, hey, can I use this? He was like, sure. And I was like, I've put your name and everything on the screen. He's like, oh, thank you. So there you go. Um, although, I, 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 you know what? I, I did ask him. Maybe he could make me one of these at some point in time was to make a like 10, <laughs> 10 minute looping version of this song so that it doesn't actually fade away and come back in, you know? <laughs> What up, Book of Respect? Hope you're doing well too, man. <sighs> All right. You ready? Are we ready to go, David? Mm -hmm. All right. Hello, welcome back everybody to the Tuesday show here on twitch.tv slash TV. My name is James Chen and I am joined of course here by, whoa, <laughs> Shrunken David. <laughs> hey everybody, thanks for having me back. I appreciate it. I went to go get some food in the meantime. <laughs> Oops, I definitely need to fix this. It was segment. a little spicy and oh boy. All right, here we go. Ah, there we go. Forgot I used that shrink ray on you there. Ah, here we excellent. go. Excellent. <laughs> Back to my normal strength. <coughs> oh, my God. Back to my normal strength. What? Featuring, as is normal for me, my animation lines. You can see I'm effectively yes. outlined. That's just normal life for me. Don't worry, I'm, 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 I'm fixing, I've got that handled here, I'm, I'm, I've got that. No, 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 no problem, that's how it is. Yeah, animation lines are, uh, oh, oh dang, and you're also, oh shoot, and you're... Don't worry everybody, things are great. <laughs> I feel fine. <laughs> oh sure, sometimes life feels like it's moving sideways. But, <laughs> overall, I think I feel pretty good. And... Your arm is bleeding through the table here. Let's see here. Oh, what do you got today, David? Ah! I got I got pasta. Thanks to the thanks to Guest Perry God for the sub. Additionally. Thanks to Kodak Squid for the sub. Okay. Much obliged to everybody. Well, I don't think I'm gonna be able to avoid that. Okay, never mind. I think I'm just i have to figure out a way to do that. Are you talking about my animation lines? That's just life for me, man. <laughs> you want to move on to the next topic here? Yes. Let us do that real quick. All right. There we go. Uh... All right. So, uh, do you want to run this one? Sure. I mean, we can talk about this a little bit. So, uh, obviously, this past weekend has been... Uh, pretty full of drama here going on in the FGC. A lot of uh, crazy things going on. Um, stemming largely from a situation where, uh, you know, Sarah Blast uh, played an online match against Low Tier God. And, you know, Low Tier God obviously has a, you know, history of getting mad and, and, and you know, uh, playing up the anger aspect when he's streaming and everything. And I think, you know, a lot of people when they play against LTG like to troll him a little bit. And so Saro uh, proceeded to just throw out a bunch of sweeps, crush countered uh, LTG a bunch of times. And, uh, and then basically at that point in time, uh, LTG got really mad, rage quit, and uh, then decided... Now, recently, Saro Blast also revealed uh on her twitter that she was coming out as uh you know uh as as going with the gender uh term she her um and um because of that after ltg rage quit started going on a lot of um transphobic tirade basically and just kind of yeah. went off on it for a quite some time and uh, it started making it out uh, onto the internet, uh, largely 
through Sarah Blast's Twitter, you know, she posted it up and said that, you know, this is what he was saying and everything. And then uh, LTG then got banned from events like Evo and um, and Combo Breaker. Or Rick and, and the Evo staff and Wizard came out and said that uh, LTG uh, was banned from those events. And then... Uh, in kind of a retaliation, uh, a lot of people started pointing out, you know, tweets from Sarah Blast, where in the past, you know, even just last year, uh, you know, has used the N word on Twitter, and then uh, also has clips of online, you know, streaming and using the N word uh, there as well, and uh, as a result, then uh, Rick. And uh, and Evo and C. I should mention CEO also banned uh, LTG as well uh, yeah. pretty early yeah, on. I think I think ECT as well. ECT okay. Uh, so a lot of the events then also <laughs> banned Cero Blast uh, as well. Uh, not for quite as long. LTG seems to be like a permanent ban for a lot of these. And uh, Cero Blast was more just like you're not welcome until 2021 or 2022, depending on the event. And then what was interesting is that then a lot of people were like, oh, well, you know, if Cerro Blast is going to get banned for that, then everybody who's done it in the past should get banned for it. And uh, people started digging through Twitter history, looking for people who have used the N-word on Twitter, uh, including myself. Uh, I've had, uh, I think, two or three tweets where I've actually used the word, which, to be honest with you, was kind of shocking to myself. Uh, but... Uh, they definitely came up, and so now, uh, you know, Justin Wong has said stuff in the past, uh, has used it before in the past in a 2012 tweet. My tweets were all 2013 and earlier, and um, basically uh, now a lot of people are calling for everybody to be banned who has basically ever used the word uh, in any sort of public form or social media kind of environment and so that's kind of the situation right now so number one the main thing right now is that LTG has been banned from all these events and now uh, Cerro Blast has been banned for a shorter amount of time and now we're reaching this question is what do we do about the people who have used the term uh, in the past uh, on Twitter uh, the reason why I have an address up here is because I, I want to talk about from my perspective on, on this whole entire topic. I don't know if you want me to do that now or if we want to talk about the bigger situation at hand because I'm, I'm, I'm only just a small piece of this thing. I don't know if you want to talk first about what, the, whatever, what do you, whatever you feel like you want to do is cool with me. The, the bigger issues. I mean, I guess, because uh, the thing about it is, like, I, I don't want to come out here and be like, you know, hey, guys, like, I feel terrible if anybody was offended by my tweets. You know, I don't want to do that kind of thing. Um, yeah. Yeah. I have already publicly said that if it, the decision comes down to ban me, I will 100% accept it because uh, it wasn't right to use the word back then. The only thing that in my, like, the worst part about it is, is when you do try to defend yourself, it's, it's, it makes it seem very disingenuous. It makes your apologies seem very disingenuous. Um, the only things that I will say to, I guess, defend my usage of the word was that 2013 was a very different James. And I will say it in the kindest way possible is that I was stupid and ignorant <laughs> and uh, actually really uneducated on a lot of things uh, back in 2013. Uh, I've mentioned before to other people that I was still referring to transgendered people as traps. I was still using the R word for Marvel commentary. Uh, I was saying a lot of terrible things back then. And I just wasn't socially educated. I wasn't socially educated back then. I mean, you know, right? I mean, you guys used to all laugh at me around that time is when I was, you know, making comments about injecting heroin and, like, uh, injecting marijuana, I think it was. or And I didn't know. I, I used the word taint, and you guys were all laughing at me. And I was like, what's so funny about this word? You know, like, I mean, honestly, 2013, I, obviously these have no relation, like, nor levels of familiarity. But it's just, like, literally back then I was... 
about as socially inept and worldly unaware as possible. And of course, these are all very different levels of things. Um, yeah. The other thing that I will mention, though, is that uh, at least in the context of every time I use the word, uh, they were in, intended to be positive. Uh, I still even remember, I think the time that I really, really figured out that the N-word was a problem and see, this was in 2014, and this is how much I can remember every time I've used the word. I use the word in person. I think, I, I'm, no, I'm 100% positive I said it to K-Brad and, uh, at, at an Evo. You know, something happened, and I said it in a positive way because I really honestly thought the word was taken back and turned into a positive connotation. That was my interpretation of it. And so I was trying to use it in a positive fashion as well. And after I said it, like, K-Brad just had this look on his face like, that's not cool. And, you know, and as soon as that happened, and then there was the Justin Wong, Mike Ross video that came out. It was old. That video was had existed for a long time, but it eventually became a little bit like people brought up the fact that Justin used the N-word in the video years later. It was those kind of incidents where I really started learning that, you know, what my original perception and, you know, how I thought of it was wrong. And so again, I, you know, I, I'm not trying to defend my use of the word. I'm just trying to explain why I was ignorant, why I was stupid. And there's no way that I can say that I don't deserve a ban or I don't deserve punishment or repercussions. Uh, if that happens, absolutely. Uh, ignorance is ignorance, but ignorance is still my fault. Let's just put it that way. So I still accept uh, the blame. I haven't deleted the tweets because that's just running away and hiding from it. Uh, I don't want to do that. I don't want to be the kind of, unless someone recommends me that I should delete the tweets. I don't know. I, I'm leaving them there because I don't want to feel like I'm trying to hide something. I'd rather just admit that yes, I was stupid back then, I was uneducated, and I was uh, a terrible person uh, back then in terms of that kind of thing. And so if they want to ban me, I will accept the punishment. So there you go. Okay, well, I'm not sure anybody's intending to do that. Um, I mean, it's, look, I... It, it has nothing to do with, okay, one thing I want to mention in there, it has nothing to do with age. This has nothing to do with I was young, I didn't know better. No, this was me being sheltered and just having very little cultural, worldly knowledge and awareness. Again, this has nothing to do with age. Uh, you can be stupid and ignorant even in your 30s. So uh, <laughs> that, that's the way it works. So... Uh, I was stupid and ignorant in my 30s. So that that's just what it is. That's just where it comes from. So, yeah. All right. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's not that, that I, I'm not among the people for whom that word has the great negative meaning. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, it's I, I understand that it is, but it's not sort of the personal attack for me that I know it is for some. So I'm not going to say what is cool and what's not. I imagine that context matters. Mm -hmm. And yeah. yeah. I also imagine that your context is probably not what many people are specifically worried about, but, you know, I'm glad that you're not seeing it anymore, definitely. Right. Yeah, I mean, like I said, I don't think I've said it in the last, like, like I said, over half a decade now at this point in time. And even back then, I barely ever used the word. Those are might be the only instances I can ever remember using it because right. I... I think I was just trying to use it to, to, to like sound cool or something like that. I don't know, because that's been a problem for me my whole life. So. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, I would not be cool if people use the K word casually. No, uh, there's also no way to use it casually. Um, it's different in that context. Mm -hmm. uh, the anti-Jewish slurs are just attacks. There's no, there's no sort of recl reclamation of it at all. Right. Um, so I think it's just it's probably just a different situation. Mm -hmm. 
Anyway, uh, okay. Well, as far as the stuff that happened this past weekend, the ban on LTG is, uh, you know, I'm not sure exactly why this is the moment that it was triggered, like why this is the thing that immediately made the ban happen. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I haven't spoken with anybody specifically about that, right? But what I imagine is that it's due to the body of work, right? It's a, it's a very long-standing issue. Mm -hmm. And this, to, this was gross and offensive. So were the many racist things that he said, and so were the many ableist things that he said, and the homophobic yeah. things, and the you know joking about animal cruelty. There's just a lot that is bad there. And so, I mean, my guess is that it's really just more about the sort of it's been going on <laughs> uh, kind of situation, and that's that for whatever reason this was the finality of it. And and you know why this was, I don't know, but certainly it was bad. And um, I mean, like I said on Twitter, I'm I'm glad that it happened. Um, I want the scene to be more uh, inclusive. I don't mind uh, if that means that some people are left out of it in order to increase inclusivity, right? Which is certainly a, an effect of this, of this kind of thing. Uh, because I want there to be more people who feel comfortable playing fighting games. And I want to have more players in the scene, and I want to I have a friendlier scene for the people who are in it. I don't want to continue to have the toxicity. So I'm, I mean, it, in my view, it should have been done many, many years ago. And, mm -hmm. and I certainly said that in many occasions um it's not something that i think about very often but whenever there's like news as there was this weekend i sort of get reminded about it and uh i wish that it had happened earlier um okay so i'm glad that that did occur as far as the stuff that Cero did um i think that was pretty ill-advised i mean there were there were not it was in my mind not a nice joke so while it may not have been like a specifically gross attack, it was nevertheless like a not, it wasn't a nice joke. Mm -hmm. And that's not the kind of thing that I want either. And again, for the people who are more personally affected by that, I know that that did have a big impact. And I've talked with people who have expressed that. So right. that's, and, and had felt that way previously, by the way, um, that, that this is not like a new right. issue that it mm -hmm. has exactly. been an ongoing thing. Um, so okay, I, in that in that kind of instance, I think that that kind of uh, punishment makes sense as well. What I want to make sure that we don't do is say think that it's the same to have done this for most of a decade and to have been, you know, racist and and bigoted and on all sorts of ways that LTG's been, um, and for there to and and the sort of gross but uh, uh, less intentionally attacking bullying sort of things that uh Sarah's done i don't want either and i think that they should both be punished and i think it's the right call to do so mm -hmm. i also want to make clear that they that the sort of ongoing career of it is especially bad uh, so you know whether somebody has had player uh, uh problems being physical at a tournament or not which i'm not aware of for ltg i i want to create a safer atmosphere and that's not just about whether somebody physically attacks somebody else okay there's other ways and one of the ways is by bullying somebody online even if you're not going to actually do something in real life and you know that the other people don't and the other people who may see you around and may think that's the guy who you know has been attacking people who look like me or people who act like me or whatever think like me uh, that's not a welcoming atmosphere either. So I, I, I think there's still good reasons to not have that kind of person around. Uh, yeah, as far as as far as the punishments, I think that I'm okay with both. I want I want to I want to make clear that it, I think I think there's a way, and I think I might have fed into it that the LTG issue kind of obscures the stuff that is additionally a problem, right. which is is the idea of uh, racism in the FGC, which mm -hmm. definitely still exists. Mm -hmm. I mean, even though there are many people of color in the FGC, it still definitely exists. Yeah. Uh, sometimes it's perpetrated you know, by folks who look the same, unfortunately. So that's bad. We definitely have to try to root that out. And the LTG issue sort of hides in it in a way because it, it makes you focus on the particularly gross things that he's been doing. But the issue exists nevertheless. So I don't I don't want to always view 
the Sero thing in comparison with the LTG thing because comparing it makes you think that one is worse than the other or that one type of offense is worse than the other, which is not what is meant by compare, comparing that. The only comparison in my mind is the length of time and, and whether there was specifically attacking and bullying or not, mm -hmm. not the type of offense. Um, so I, I, I just I want to make sure that we can, that we do highlight that that there is there is a problem. It is something that we need to address. And while I'm not sure that your things from eight years ago that were meant as positive count as being the offense, uh, yeah, I want to make sure that that we cut it out. Absolutely right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And like I said, the key thing is that you know uh, you learn from that kind of thing, right? So I mean, like I said, I. I, I learned a lot around that time, and I have cut out many, many different kinds of very offensive words, you know. Look, from... we, we've talked about this before. I yeah. mean, yeah, it was it was the same for me. Um, I certainly come from a place and time that's not dissimilar to you, and there were things that we said growing up that I absolutely regret, mm -hmm. and that ultimately I learned more and sort of figured out how to be a little bit more empathetic to things, was exposed to more people, had more friends from more different backgrounds, and that made me think and I, and I have learned and I think that's the case for many of us who are in our generation. I hope that we, for the future generations, sort of can try to bypass that step. That's super hard and I'm not sure that we're ever going to actually make that done. Mm -hmm. But I want to try at least to make it so that we don't have to go through the phase of, well you grow up saying the gross stuff and eventually you learn better about it. Let's just not do the things in the first place. Right. Uh, right. I mean, again, I'm not sure that we'll ever solve racism. It's like a many centuries long thing. It's half a millennium at this point in, in its current stage. So is it going to happen in our generation? Maybe not. But we can definitely try, and I think that we can con continue pushing that forward um, because hopefully at some point, even if it's not in our lives, it will happen. Uh, yeah. I mean, but anyway, I, I certainly am not without uh, fault when it comes to using words that I would regret now mm -hmm. um it's never been the n-word but it has been yeah i mean it's other stuff for sure that were considered normal in my place and time that i regret now and that i don't do anymore yeah so it, there's there's certainly there there is and has to be room to figure out how to grow uh, right i mean what we want is what i want is not to have to ban ltg that's not what I want. What I want is for him to quit it <laughs> and to like <laughs> not have a stream that's based around the gross stuff and, right. and to not make people who go to events, uh, uh, you know, associate them with somebody who does say negative things, even if there's right. no physicality. Um, I, I don't, you know, ideally that's what happens, but it's never been what's happened uh, throughout many, many years and, and different instances. So I think there's probably not going to be a reclamation there. Maybe for Sarah, and, and maybe that's why there's not a lifetime ban, right? I mean, mm -hmm. maybe they can learn and, and figure it out more, which is good. That's, that's I think, what we want. Yeah. And and also, you know, the, 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 the thing is, you know, the evidence of learning, right? So if Sarah Blast makes this apology, and, you know, the apology, you know, was not worded pro very well okay it wasn't it didn't i didn't like the sound of the apology and you know if if saro comes back and does the same thing again and there's no lesson to be learned then you know keep the ban going you know ban again kind of thing it's it's one of those things yeah, and, and and i i agree with folks in the chat who are saying that saro's apology was not well done yeah, uh, it was. It seemed like more of an excuse than anything yeah. else. So I think that might have even fed into negative feelings towards her. Uh, you know, that's that definitely could have been better handled. I feel right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But look, it, as people are saying in the chat as well, you know, folks have done gnarly stuff at Evo in person, going back to the beginning. But uh, and they may, they, although there were some bands for sure. Uh, that may be, may, those may have been different sorts of things. Not just words. That w it, it was not a good time to have people saying, you know, homophobic slurs all the time. That's not good, right? I mean, it is what we were doing, but it's not good. <sighs> and so now that we're in the present, we can do things differently, right? Yeah. You're not bound to how you acted 10, 15 years ago, nor is Evo. 
and we need to again figure out how to move forward and make the FGC and you know all all of the little communities that right. we're all parts of uh, more inclusive and and more welcoming. Yeah, but you know, with the FGC being as diverse it is, sometimes I I think you mentioned as well that we can accidentally overlook the racism that happens in the FGC, but it is definitely an issue and it's definitely something that you know shouldn't be shouldn't be made less than any other you know uh targeted group you know yeah i mean it's it's something that uh is very commonly invisible to the people who are not the targets you know what i mean mm-hmm. like it, it's it's rare that um people who i've I haven't often been around people who use like the hard R, for example. Right. Uh, instead, the racism is when there's like not a white person around, or it's in in a way that I'm not accustomed to looking for. I I mean I'm accustomed to looking for different sorts of things, and I certainly get you know anti-Semitic flack to this day. That's not something that I talk about very often, but it definitely still occurs. Um, I mean it's been occurring over this past weekend. So there's that that is, I'm sure, invisible to lots of people. Yeah. They're not specifically looking for it. It's not directed to them. So when somebody tells you that they're experiencing racist or homophobic or transphobic attacks, whatever whatever it may be, listen to them because yeah. they yeah. they know what their experiences have been. Um, you know, misogynistic attacks. They they know they're they're the ones who've been there. So if uh, as has been the case. You know, people in the African American FGC have said that they have been facing problems. Yeah, believe them. Yeah, you know what I mean, if it's yeah. not something that you yourself see, it's oftentimes not something that you see. Yeah, just take it serious. I mean, the the interesting thing about it too is, you know, I've had a lot of people talking to me on Twitter about it. Good discourse, and you know, the main thing that I'm making sure of is that I listen to them and I hear what they say, and you know, you just. You, you have to believe all the stuff that's happening over there. And, you know, obviously it's, you know, it's a bigger problem than the FGC, right? It's of it's, it's, of it's everywhere, but... There's a whole movement politically yeah. based on it. So. But, you <laughs> it's a pretty big deal, unfortunately. We are here in the FGC. That's where our focus is. And if we can be the example to set to make things better, sure. And, and again, it's not about, you know cleaning up and making sure that we're completely squeaky clean and whatever like that. No, I mean, there's clearly boundaries and lines to cross. You know, if you have people, you know, I mean, just even, I think starting in like 15 minutes, there's going to be this little fun uh, uh, exhibition match online between Rushdown and Rob TV. Uh, they're doing like a first fi- first to five or something because they were talking trash to each other or something like that. And, you know, but it's funny because they were being very respectful to each other about it, but you can still tell they want to beat each other. And, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like that kind of thing. I'll, let's keep doing it. Like, let's keep the trash of talk course. going and everything. And let's oh, keep... there's definitely trash talking you can still do. Yeah, 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 yeah for sure. If for you sure. can't think of more interesting trash talk than racist stuff, like, that's come on. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> there's exactly. A lot, there's a lot better stuff to handle on yeah, that yeah, yeah. than that, mm-hmm. for sure. Yeah. So no, there's there's things about the old school FGC that uh, I certainly want to preserve. I I like the joviality. I like ribbing each other. Uh, I like the ideal of having respect for somebody if they beat you. I think we haven't often lived up to that ideal, but that's the ideal that I that I like. There's a lot that I like, but there's also a lot of grossness that I think we should just jettison. Mm-hmm. Um, there's mm-hmm. a lot of toxicity and a lot of exclusivity that I think was bad that I right. think we should not continue to do. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, uh, I mean, also, the people who have been looking through old tweets to try to attack, I think there's certainly, again, I don't want to minimize the reality of the problem of racism in the right. FGC. Yes. And there are people uh-huh. who take that seriously. But there are also people who have been doing this stuff out of a real disingenuousness um, to effectively turn a ban on LTG into a, an attack on somebody else, right. uh, even if it's uh, a deserve a reasonable attack in, in some cases, the motivation behind at least some of the people out there is also disingenuous, right? These are two separate things. It's part right. of why I said that I think the LTG mm-hmm. issue is hiding stuff. But it's that is also going on, and that sucks. I don't, I don't feel any requirement to 
have any kind of discourse with people who do that. Uh, you know, if you're mm -hmm. if you are going after somebody at, in order to attack them for something that's not as bad as the person you're defending has said, then you're screwing up. I mean, that's you have to get get it together. Like that's not something that you should be doing with your time. Yeah, yeah. And you know, like I said, that's why I'm not trying to hide from anything, and that's why I said if anything happened, I'm 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 down to accept it. So. Because I'm, you know, like I said, uh, just, it wasn't right. It's not right. So I'm, I'm not going to hide behind it. So, hmm. Cancel but, culture, which I continue to think is not, like, a reality in the way that it's often used. Well, I mean. Uh, LTG, it, this should have happened a long time ago. So there's people who we should, <laughs> we should do that, I feel. Uh, and then there's, in addition, this kind of disingenuousness that I think is only tangentially related. And I feel that, in fact, when I see somebody talk about cancel culture, I feel that it's the opposite. When, when somebody is going for the disingenuousness, the blanket is cancel culture. And that's, that's to say, like, that's their motivation. That's their concern. And so I'm not, I'm not worried about those people because I don't want them around. I don't want that. Uh, however, I do think that people should be should suffer consequences uh, for having said and done gnarly stuff. I just think in general, when it comes to the reality of how it, that works out in major culture, you know, some, somebody gets canceled and then has a very successful comedy tour, right? Somebody gets canceled and then has a very successful album that comes out right away. I, I don't see a lot of evidence for the reality of it. <laughs> Right. Ah, okay. So, so there's there's the opposite side of it that I think is for sure real, but it's not often meant by cancel culture, which is that there certainly is a power structure that likes to keep itself in place, for yes, sure. Yeah, and okay, if that's what okay. somebody in the chat means by this, then that's true. But what is often meant instead is the idea that people who aren't in the power structure like, finally are trying to uh, have some impact over what gets said in the world, right. and that gets viewed as cancel culture by the people who are the targets of, like finally some action by people who have not wanted to have been attacked this entire time so for sure some people get kicked out of stuff but i don't know if anybody means cancel culture when they're talking about colin kaepernick that doesn't seem like the same thing to me right. to the extent that you think it is then that's real of course yeah okay uh anything else you want to say on the subject matter or uh, no, I think that's it. I mean, it, it's not something that I want to spend a lot of time highlighting, to be frank. Right. Uh, I want, I would rather have, uh, not, I would rather have the people who do these things fade. I don't want to lose focus on the problems, which we need to continue to think about, but the people who do the things, I would rather not highlight for a long period mm. of time. Okay. Well, uh, do you want to just jump on to the next stuff then here? Certainly. Okay. Yeah, yeah. If, somebody, if somebody makes a good faith effort and does change, fantastic. That's yeah, yeah. What is much preferable to the alternative, for sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. What do we got on some, like, 5-5 five, five matchup stuff here going on? All right. So I think we kind of did discuss part of what I wanted to address uh, in the <laughs> Ultra Chan uh five five before we get to the viewer choice okay. but it was basically about simplicity in games versus complexity in games uh, and which you prefer and maybe whether both could be good uh oh yeah oh well, i mean yeah absolutely both could be fine uh okay. i think uh and you're i'm you're talking specifically about fighting games right and and yeah definitely in fighting games yeah, yeah. no i mean obviously as a person who loves guilty gear which is one of the most complex fighting games out there, and a person who loves Samurai Showdown, uh, I find that both can work very, very well. Uh, okay. Fighting games don't have to be complex to be deep. They don't have to be simple to be easy or approachable or fun or whatever. Uh, you can make a fighting game pretty much however you want to. Uh, the, the thing about it is is that you have to make a fighting game, like Keats was saying, with, with a goal in mind, with an audience in mind, which is what I've been saying, right? You know, Street Fighter V Season 1 was created as a response to the complaints of Street Fighter Four, 
uh, when people ask me what I want in Street Fighter 6, I just say, have a vision. Don't pay mm -hmm. attention to what happened in 5 and make it a response to what 5 is. To have a goal. Like, people ask me, what would I do if I made Street Fighter 6? My goal would be, because it's the sixth one, we just make it so every three games goes back to parries. And I would actually try to build a new parry Street Fighter game. I think okay. that would be sick. You know, I don't like parries, but that yeah. to me is a vision and trying to find a way to make it work. Like make everybody's parries like gills, for example, that it has, you know, delay and stuff like that. And make it so you can parry in the air and kind of bring back that kind of uh, excitement for the fans that love Third Strike. I think it would be okay. cool. That's a good vision. It's a good goal, you know what I mean? And you build the game around that idea instead of how do we make a fighting game that doesn't piss off all the th things that made people mad about five. Right, you okay. Know, basically is kind of what, what uh, I want. So, And yeah, that means that DPs might not be as good, but that's fine. I talked about the fact that I want DPs because they're an option to get you out of situations and parries do that, but better. Unless, of course, now you have the delay like Gil, then it serves the exact same purpose. What I want out of an invincible DP, I would get out of that kind of frame one parry uh, kind of concept. You know, make it like a third strike kind of parry again. So, Okay. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think that both simpler games and more complex games can be fun. And in mm -hmm. fact, I think that games that have fewer game mechanics aren't necessarily actually simpler than games that have more um i because i what i care about is the decisions that the player has to make and i think that sometimes having a game mechanic can solve a set of decisions that are actually could be really interesting if that game mechanic didn't exist um an example is that i actually like not having common uh, turn invincible turn stealers in right. SF5, right? Mm -hmm. Well, I'm not opposed to that in other games, but in SF5, I think that it has sort of led to this yes. way of searching for other things to do. Mm -hmm. You don't have a pair, you don't have an invincible backdash, you don't have crouch tech, you don't have uh, meterless DPs. Even Viraversal doesn't work against a lot of stuff. Right. right? You want to put block in time. So instead, you have to search for the different things that you can do and the different timings and the different little windows that you can escape from. You have to intentionally take damage sometimes. I really like that. And yeah. I think that it's not right to say that a game that has that mix-up is less complex than a game that has an extra game mechanic, which is just like, what if V-Reversal was guaranteed against everything? Just yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that would actually be less interesting, I think. So... Yeah. I mean, yeah, I'm not sure that it's right to say that games with fewer mechanics are simpler or mm -hmm. that ones that have more are more complex. I'm not yeah. sure that it actually is true that having more mechanics means more situations either. Yeah. So, no, I think, I, think uh, I, I certainly like both. For me, there's a floor and a ceiling on this. Some games, I think, are too simple and don't have enough going on. And I think it's possible that games could be too complicated. I don't know that I've played a game, I've played a game that I think is actually like that, but I'm, I'm sure it's possible, right? So I think, <laughs> oh, yeah. I think there's, there's some middle in here that I really prefer, but anywhere within that middle between, you know, some kind of, uh, I mean, game that doesn't have a ton of mechanics versus game that does, right. there are any number of ways for those games to still be well well or poorly yeah. designed. And, and, it's and not I even think that mechanics are really the thing. Uh, it's not even a middle. You're talking like a majority chunk. It's really just the extreme edges that could be a problem, really. <clears throat> yeah. And yeah, uh, again, like as much as I've championed Invincible DPs, I wouldn't put them back in five. The game doesn't play right with them. Right. I understand that, and I know exactly that the game is designed without them. Right, for so, sure. So, you know, I wouldn't do that, and I understand how Street Fighter V is played. In fact, I've learned yeah. that very well in the past, like, more so, you know, in the two or three months as I'm really starting to learn the pace, playing yeah. it a lot more myself, so... You've been stepping it up 100%. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I know, I, I, definitely, I definitely think that there's more there. So, anyway, 
the the thrust of this is obviously what Strive going to be, right? Strive yeah. has cut down on some of the mechanics. Some of the mechanics that are returning are seemingly less important. Does that mean the game is less strategic? Uh, we just have to wait and see, because I think that yeah. that's yeah. not... I don't think it'll necessarily Actually, be less strategic. Yeah, right. right I, yeah. I just, like I said, I, I just... I that whole concept of what your goal, what your theme is, I feel like is kind of missing from the game, except the the main concentrated theme in Guilty Gear seems to be presentation. Mm -hmm. uh, and it seems to be the majority of the focus right now is, I mean, the game looks just ridiculous. And uh, I obviously they're still paying attention a lot to the, the gameplay. But I, I feel like the gameplay feels a little more like, you know, spaghetti on the wall, see what sticks kind of thing. You know, like, okay. will it work if we do this? Eh, will it work if we do this? Eh, you know what? People didn't like this in the old game. And again, it's a response to what they think people are perceiving other things as, as opposed to just making a game that, you know, they just feel like this is the way that it will work to be balanced and fun. You know, that, that's kind of the whole situation for me, so. <clears throat> yeah, sounds good. Okay. We will have to see what happens with that game. Yep. Who knows what could change even. All right. All right, anything else to say about that? Or can uh, we go to viewer's choice? Nope. Let me know what the viewer choices are. I. Oh, could, you got it. I could not have. Here's the viewer's choice for 5-5. Five five. So, number <clears throat> one. Are all modern fighting games, in fact, balanced since... You never have to have a worse matchup than a mirror match. It's true. <laughs> it's true. Should developers... Number two. Should developers take fan feedback more seriously or focus on making the game they want to make regardless of fan feedback? Three. Should games still use damage proration systems like Guts? Is Guts helpful or harmful for players? And four... I only have four at this time. What do you think is the least explored character archetype, zoner, grappler, etc., across all fighting games? And what changes or moves would you give these characters to push them in a more unconventional direction? Huh. And that's the one that won. Okay. Number okay. four. With uh, a majority of the vote, which is rare. Usually it's a plurality, but this had 55% of the vote. Well, I mean, to be fair, the the guts one I think we kind of discussed earlier. I I agree with Keats that I just don't like the gut system at all. I don't like the gut system either. Yeah, yeah. I, just, yeah. I it, it is. It's a it's it's a way to mask what's actually happening, and yeah. I'm not a fan of it. I'm not a fan of it. So I agree. Uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> okay. So least explored mechanic. Or no, at least, least explored character, character archetype. Archetype, okay, yeah, you're right. So zoner or yeah. grappler. So okay. I was thinking about this a little bit because I thought it was a fun question. And I think that the one that I would like to see more of is the one that I like the most, surprise, surprise, <laughs> which is the defensive grappler. Because I feel that's a very rare archetype. Grapplers are usually offensive, right? The intention, maybe they're a moving wall, but they're usually intended to get in and deal damage. Right. Um, and rarely defensive. There's really only a few that are defensive grapplers. What? That was part of what I loved about Q, is that mm. he's a patient defensive grappler. Interesting, okay. It's part of what I like about General Rom and KI, because although he's a wall and he does a ton of damage on offense, he poisons you. And then now you have to come to him for that poison to go away. Uh... And so there's an inversion of how the grappler system usually works, which is that he's not coming to you anymore. Right. Now you're coming to General Rom to try to get rid of your poison. Mm -hmm. So that, that archetype is pretty rare. And Conrad's an example of maybe not a defensive, it, a little bit more trap-based, right? But a ranged grappler is also a rarity. That, that kind of archetype is one that I'd love to see more of. Hmm. Interesting. Okay, okay. Yeah, I mean, for me... Uh... It's kind of weird because uh, especially the way the question is worded, it's like, what moves would you give these characters to push them in a more unconventional direction? Uh, the reason why it's hard for me to say is because uh, I, I just feel like the unconventional character is kind of the archetype that I feel like isn't explored enough, you know? Uh, okay. I, you know, uh, I see people in the chat mentioning these kind of things like Jacko 
is such a weird character in Guilty Gear, you know, with planting houses and trying to send out minions and, and, and do yeah. crazy things like that. I, even the way Faust works in Strive right now, I think is hilarious because the, the items that he gets are, are kind of like even more ridiculous now than, than they were like, you can get the horn that sends the army at <laughs> people right, yeah. and everything, you know? Um, I, 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 I want to see more super unconventional stuff. And, and, you know, again, I know that this is hard to say, hard to do because as I've joked about many times in the past is I, I tried to design a fighting game and, you know, my friend told me that no one would buy my fighting game and now I totally believe them, <laughs> you uh -huh. know, because like I would like to make like very, very strange kind of things like that, you know, which is one of the reasons why I did appreciate a game like Injustice 2 so much because I felt right. like they did a really good job with a lot of the different character archetypes in there, you know, even though they had like four zoner five zoners they all played very different zonery zoning kind of games sure. you know and uh i, I kind of like that a lot and so you know i i would love to see just kind of wackier more unconventional i love monat's orbs i mean i'll, I'll never i, I i'll always cool. think that's such an awesome thing because it just allows for creativity and just gives us the possibility to see things that we'll never ever be able to see you know unfortunately things like you know, Modoc learning cubes never quite panned out the way that, you know, it would have been cool. If you it just do long combos instead, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. It just, it doesn't have any sort of health there. Yeah, I would play, I would play Manat, except I, I just, it takes too much time. <laughs> I can't do it. So I'll but yeah, I mean, you, you remember when they nerfed her V-Trigger 1 from two to three bars? I thought that was a mistake. Yeah, Because yeah, I yeah. wanted to see more. I thought that was cool. Mm -hmm, I thought mm -hmm. that they should have nerfed some other parts of the character because she was yeah. really good. She probably should have been nerfed, but I would, I would rather have seen other stuff rather than the things that was super unique, which was V-Trigger 1. Right. Yeah, like like uh, like uh, someone up there just mentioned, uh, oh, whoa, there was a character that someone just mentioned up there. Oh, Phoenix Wright, for example, you know, it's just, it's just such a cool, like, little mechanic. Like, having characters with sub-goals to right. help them with their main goals... You know, because, like, that was the one thing, that was the mistake they made in Johnny in in XX, in Exerd, I should say, is okay. that outside of the one hit in Sengas, like, it was really, really hard to recoin somebody in, in, in the original Guilty Gears. So the idea for him was to, your whole goal was to hit someone with a coin, and then you could do a long combo. In fact, the first combo that you did usually was a sacrificial combo to hit him with a coin, so the next one would do damage. If you could hit him with a random coin, that was even better. And so it was interesting that way, because then the next combo he would do was this gob of damage, but then he had to start all over again. The reason right. why Johnny was kind of broken and exerted was because every combo led into coin again and so he was basically just in that state the whole entire time and they also did something interesting in the original xx is that xx in that level three coin was actually not as useful as level mm. two coin so you kind of when you hit someone with a coin you didn't want to hit them with it again because then you lost oh, okay. some of your combos and you okay. know it was really interesting how he was designed and so he was really about this coin management that i thought was really fascinating that gave him this cool execution mechanic which was the mist can Canceling and stuff like that and so you know the reason why he was too powerful i think in exert is they kind of lost sight of that that mm -hmm. kind of design for him unfortunately so uh but again that kind of thing right having that secondary goal to accomplish the actual goal of beating the opponent is always something that i've kind of liked you know, yeah, I agree with you. You know, like Jury would have been a lot more interesting if the buildup that she got was a lot more rewarding than than yeah. it cost. You know, what I mean, because right now the power ups aren't nearly strong enough to justify yeah. her having to kill most of her offense to build up Fuhajins. You know, and building up the Fuhajins isn't necessarily as integrated as a lot of the other ideas are. Like that's kind of why I like Balrog's new V skill. Because it's not something that you just dash the screen away and do, like, Fuhajin, you know, and now it's here. You kind of have to think about it, try to get a knockdown to build up into it so you're scarier, yeah. uh, etc. Not as Zangief, let me tell you, he's got that thing the entire match. Yeah. So, it's tough. <laughs> <laughs> no, I like, I like leveling stuff up, too. Yeah. It's part of why I played Hakan, it's part of why I played G when that character was new. 
Uh, it's part of why I play. I like Q, for example, right? Mm-hmm. Leveling up the taunts. So that's something that I that I like as well. You know me. I like the weirdos. Yeah. yeah so yeah. I want the funky characters yeah. for sure. And if that character is also a weirdo ranged grappler, that's just the absolute. <laughs> I, I mean, I think it was Caramel Jenkins in chat who mentioned Chrome Dome, one of the yes absolute God. pinnacle designs of a fighting game character. Robot, awesome. Ranged like awesome, and has command grab. Mm-hmm. And his invincible move is a fireball. Uh, that's what a great character. His what fireball character. was the invincible reversal. Yep. I don't think I knew <laughs> that. Okay. Yeah. That's <laughs> kind of sick. Okay. Yeah, it is pretty sick. Yeah, it's pretty silly. Yeah. Uh, that game has a bunch of crazy stuff though. Yeah. It, so it was. It's definitely cool. Yeah. I mean, Manser in the chat mentions Venom. You know, Venom was a character that when he first came out, I was like, God, I want to learn this character. But whew, the amount of time and effort needed to learn that character was more than I was willing to put in at that time. <laughs> so I do think, though, that in general, I mean, as a, as a whole, you can find most of the archetypes that I think are have been done. I mean, maybe, maybe there's something new that can be done. Like, Jack was basically a new idea. Um but in general, I think most of the ones that have been done, that can be done, have been done. It's just a question of searching out the fighting games that have them. Because yes, most yeah. games don't have every archetype. And even if they do have them, it might not even be a good fighting game. <laughs> and it might not be, yeah. Although, yeah. although I will say, you know, a lot of times you do have to explore a lot of the uh, indie games out there. Oh, that's uh, true. I sure. explored uh, them's fighting herds recently. And the character archetypes of that game are just crazy. They let those characters do some wild stuff, and it's very inventive, and, and I like it. I like it. I That's think great. it's really Absolutely. cool. Absolutely. I think they have a lot of really cool character designs. Uh, another vote for KI on my end. I mean, part, a big part of why I like that game mm-hmm. so much mm-hmm. is that I do think it has a lot of very inventive archetypes. And, yeah. And even even Ryu is weird in that game. Even Zangief's weird in that game. Even Dalsim's weird. Like, it's... They're... Definitely based on some of the old ideas, for sure. Mm-hmm. But they're weird. And then there's also, like, crazy triple flip spider girl and whatever <laughs> else, right? I mean, there's right. so many weird things in that game. So yeah. like, can't even get through all of them. So I, I like that. I think there's a ton of inventiveness in that. And I, I really think, as I said before, that the biggest thing that unites the games that I like the most are uh, is a big breadth of character options of having each character feel like they're unique and feel like they have funky options. Yeah. Um, I think that is a, is a good uniter of the games that I care about the most. Yeah. I mean, I think JGB pro is kind of right. You know, when he says like KI is like the Western guilty gear, there really, I think it might be the Western blaze blue. But, okay. Uh, well, um, if you are a fan of Guilty Gear, <laughs> it is the Western Guilty Gear. <laughs> oh, man. Good old Tager. Man, what a sick design. He's a grappler who makes you come to him. And not even like Rom with the poison where you want to come to him. He makes you come to him. That's yeah. what I'm talking about. Like I said, I always wish it was designed a little bit better. I felt like it was too set play in the end. That there was just too many... Here's the here's the thing that you do with it, as opposed to having it be a little more flexible and sick of just like, out of nowhere all of a sudden you just like suck them in and grab them. You know what I mean? Like that that yeah. kind. Of, it's a little too set play for me. Well, I guess that's it for that topic. Anything else to say on least explored character archetype? Uh, nope, not that I can think of. Do you want to tackle any of the rest of these here? Um, I mean, we actually did kind of address, I guess, all of these, in fact, in a way, when Keats was talking. Yeah. Are all modern fighting games, in fact, balanced, since you never have to have a worse matchup than a mirror match? Well, and I like Keats's position on this. The balance is maybe not to have the games, the characters be equal in terms of effectiveness, but instead to have them be balanced in the sense that... The, there's a character for each person. Yeah. Uh-huh, uh-huh. I think that was a really good way to phrase it. Yeah, and that that is super important for me because I know, I remember I used to have a lot of people argue with me for characters like Gen or Sakura or Viper, you know, and they're like, well, what if I like their character design and then I can't use them because of execution, blah, blah, blah. 
I mean, what if you like Zangief's design, but you hate grappling? What if you like Dalsum's design, yeah. but you want to rush down, right? You know, okay, yeah. it's that's them's fighting games, right? So you got <laughs> right. that's the way it works. So find the character that appeal that just works for you, and that's one of the hardest things is finding that balance of someone you like and is fun at the same time and can win, right? Because unless your goal is not necessarily to win, if your goal is to troll, then you can troll. So. Well, ideally, you could, you could be able to troll and win, which is the best. something that I think some characters can do in fighting games, yep. <laughs> right? Yeah, uh, no. And then, what was that? Old games are the worst balance. Like, that's not even an oh. opinion. Like, we can't even, that's not even a discussion. Modern no. games have infinitely higher quality balance than older games. There, there's the there's no disputing that. understand fighting games. What's that? The people who are making games nowadays understand fighting games. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't even I don't think, think all of them are experts, but boy, nobody was an expert in Street Fighter 2. You just couldn't be. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> okay. Commander Pepper is right. Street Fighter 1 might be the most balanced fighting game of all mm, time. Okay. But remember, that was also the most salt-inducing fighting game because when re you played against each other, whoever won, the other person couldn't even challenge again. So they just good? had to hold that. They just had to hold that. So, you know. Wow. <laughs> yeah, who, you had to both put in the quarter and you hit two players and you fight. Whoever won went on to fight the computer. There was no ability to reach out again. Wow. <laughs> well, that game might have been balanced according to equality of options, but it's not they're not balanced in the Keats Harmony sense. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and then the second question here, should developers take fan feedback more seriously or focus on making the game they want to make regardless of fan feedback? I think that we kind of addressed that yeah. too a little bit because... You know, you, it sounds like from what Keats's perspective is, as somebody who's really involved in this business, is that you can't just listen to what other people are saying. Yeah. You have to take that into account in the sense that you have to have a target audience. So that's something you must be thinking about is like who's going to buy this actual product that people's live, you know, livelihoods depend on, right? Jobs right. depend on it. Uh, there's, so there's really an economic factor that you have to consider. But in terms of the individual uh, f sort of fan requests, that is something, and you have to listen to them for keeping the game alive right? yeah, 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 for yeah, yeah, over the longer yeah. term. But I think at the same time, what he was saying was that you have to be able to uh, come up with stuff that is what you want to make. And I feel like the the blend of what you want to make and what the target audience is, if, that's, if that is good together, then maybe that's yeah. where it ends up best. I, I mean, honestly, like you, I, I've said, right, you know, have your own vision don't be a response to things that people hate. But at the same time, you still have to take some feedback there. I mean, obviously, sure. fan feedback is, is what's giving us rollback netcode in Strive at all. Fair enough. So yeah, that's, that's, right. that's super amazing and stuff like that. But, you know, it's, it's one of those things that you have to have a good idea. I mean, it's like basically Seth Killian making a lot of balance changes to vanilla Street Fighter 4. Right, you listen to the fan changes, but you also know things that they don't know. So you're like, I'm gonna nerf Gen, and then everyone's like, Why did you nerf Gen? And then people realize, Oh, okay. Like everyone who fought Yeb in San Diego were like, We yeah. know why they burned. I knew. Gen. He and I used to play online. I knew why. Yeah. yeah. So you know, you have to have that kind of person in that role. As long as you have someone like a Keats or a Mike Z or a Seth Killing or a Combo Fiend who is in that role, who can understand the ramifications or find the or are smart enough to find the underlying issue of what people are actually complaining about uh -huh. Uh -huh. you know like in season one everyone said wake up jab was too strong nobody even talks about that that hasn't changed it's just people understand now it's the rollback or the quick rise and people have gotten good at beating both now you know with good reactions and anticipation it's just in season one we didn't understand it was just like it felt random to us a wake up jab looked too powerful and of course you know, they nerf the damage of ultra canceling, so, you know, Nikali jab into V trigger doesn't kill you as badly as it used to. But, you know, people don't, when people used to complain about that, that wasn't the underlying issue, you know. So you have to be someone who can hear the feedback and understand exactly what the actual complaint is about and how to actually address it if it's worth addressing at all. So. Sounds right. Yep. Alrighty, well, I guess that's it for 5-5 matchup. There's not a lot to talk about in terms of the rest of the things, yeah. but 
a few things to highlight. So there was a patch in Tekken, 3.31. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'm no Tekken expert, but I saw some of my friends talking about it, and I guess Leroy is nerfed a bit, Gigas is buffed a bit, Katarina is buffed hmm. a bit. Okay. That's what I heard. So there you go. And then in addition, Harada says that they plan to do more, but they're behind on that because of coronavirus stuff and the fact that yeah. people haven't been able to work as much. So I mean, said I to expect that at some point. I think I think that's a uh, I think that's I think Harada speaks for the entire fighting game development scene. <laughs> I mean, that's the world, right? Like, right. Sorry, yeah. It's like, exactly. It's a global pandemic. Like, <laughs> so, yeah. uh, like, you know, uh, I I heard on Best of Five they were talking about maybe should Strive be postponed a little bit more. I mean, that might not even become a choice mm -hmm. of theirs at some point in time, right? Uh, now, yeah, obviously, okay. obviously. Uh, Arxis is a much smaller company than Bandai Namco, so it's probably still a little bit easier for them to coordinate through the... Because honestly, the bigger the company is, the harder the virus is going to hit them. Because when you have multiple departments that need feedback and, you know, you can't walk up to somebody's desk and be like, hey, you know, <laughs> kind of situation. But if you're Arxis and you're already a, ma a team of like 12 people, it's probably a little bit easier to coordinate. But I wouldn't be surprised if we're going to see a lot more delayed stuff just in terms of releases uh, for, for a lot of fighting games uh, at this point. I think that's probably right. And then other game news. Did you see the Zoe trailer for Grand Blue Fantasy? Versus? I did. I did, actually. And uh, seems kind of cool. Uh, a lot of people yeah. saying that looks like she might be a puppet character with the dragon. I don't right. know if that'll necessarily be the case. I have a funny feeling it's just going to be like you do a special move, the dragon does something, and then you move without it or something. But... I guess that is puppety, but I, I have a funny feeling it's not going to be as complex as like Carl or, or somebody like that. Or oh, oh, hang on a second, I lost you, David. David, uh, there you go. Hey, hello. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. I mean, <clears throat> I'm here. <clears throat> just, just a little. Throw yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. That's right. That's right. Uh, uh, speak up. Yeah, for sure. So it's you think it's more like Chang and Choi and not not like Carl. A, a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, that's my guess. That's my guess. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, we'll see. I mean, she's well animated, of course. Mm -hmm. Pretty game, no doubt about that. Yeah. And then, as far as other community news, I just wanted to talk about the fact that there are still online things going on. If you're a player or somebody who wants to watch, there is actually a lot of stuff going on right now, even though there's no majors, obviously. Mm -hmm. uh, there's still Ronin Rumble and, and the Coliseum, so that's, you know, Grand Blue. I don't know if he's still doing Sam Show as well. He is. He is. He's still he doing is. both. He's so, still doing both. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. So that's Sam Show and uh, Grand Blue. And Coliseum for Mortal Kombat 11 is still going on. That's every Sunday and then Wednesday for the top eight. Uh, Reddit.com slash Street Fighter, our Street Fighter, is uh, still doing weekly events. There's an East Coast tournament on Monday. And then I think Friday is the one where it's West Coast for the U.S., Dude, NLBC they, they, and Wednesday Night Fights are both still doing Street Fighter. The Salt Mine League is still doing stuff. There's there's a lot that's going on. So if you feel like this is a time when you want to play games or watch games, I just wanted to shout out the people who I think have been doing a good job. Dude, of it. They, they said that RSF had like over 100 people this last they week did. enter it. So They had yeah, over 100 people. Um, it's, it is, I mean, it is kind of sad that they don't get as many views as as they should be getting right now. I'm not sure what makes it so that they don't but it's hopefully more and more people do start tuning in and watching them uh i, I have noticed the numbers going up i don't know if it's where they want but it's definitely been going up yeah uh, i mean i catch it i uh, catch it do you know uh hi or anybody what the channel it's streamed on right now is it reddit sf i think it is I'd have to find it in my little list of follow channels uh, i know high fight watches it i know high fight watches I, mean, I watch it too oh okay okay but it's just it just pops up in my list of streams. Yeah, I, I mean, I I'm kind of being hypocritical here because like I I just don't watch a lot of streams unfortunately. But oh, no. uh, I'm actually starting to change. I've been watching a lot more match videos. I've been watching a ton of Lucia videos now. I saw you actually going over gunfights videos earlier today, which I sure did, man. Which yeah, I thought. By the way, it's Reddit fighting. Oh, Reddit fighting. Okay, there you go. Monday and Friday nights. And uh, I thought that was funny because I had j literally just watched a ton of gunfights, Lucia matches, just to okay. actually just start trying to pick up on things on what they're doing and everything. So, yeah. yeah. 
uh, that was definitely cool. I was doing that today. Yeah. And I almost kind of wish I was there to help you with that because there's a lot of things I could have, I know, like I was watching like Sevele is also another great Lucia player from the Northwest and uh, he's been doing really well in events and I, I'll watch their matches and stuff will happen. I'm like, oh, execution error. I've done that many times. <laughs> sure, yeah. <laughs> you know? <laughs> in, in, the, in the stream chat, Defeat Lee was hanging out and pointing things out. So that was oh, okay, cool, 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 cool. Nice, nice, nice. As well as a couple other people who play the character, which yeah, was uh, which yeah. was nice for sure. Yeah. No, so I'm... in addition, uh, throughout this week, there's also a Mortal Kombat show going on called Combat for a Cause. Now this takes place on Facebook Gaming. It's fa it's fb.gg slash Mortal Kombat. Um, so if you are willing mm. to watch there, then you can watch this. It's just a charity event, and it happened yesterday. It'll happen Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday is the end of it. Oh, dang. Each day for two hours at 11 a.m. Pacific time. Huh. Uh, so whatever that is for wherever okay. you, you live. And it's all custom variations. So <laughs> there's nothing on the line for the players. There's no money involved. It's just about, you know, trying to raise money for the UN Foundation, um, which has been good. So they've been raising Damn. some money for the UN Foundation there. And, so uh, people are just going to get hit by stuff that they have no idea what's happening. <laughs> that has absolutely happened. Already. That's yeah, awesome. It's been, it's been great. What yeah, a good yeah. idea. Yeah, it's been great. Uh, Gurr, such genius, man. So he's now eliminated, but he was playing Gearus with the variation where he has a little um, gravity well, like new gravity well that keeps the opponent like still more or less. Uh -huh, he can't uh -huh. like, actually dash out of it. And he's got uh, the one where he can take time off the clock real fast. <laughs> so he, so he called it he called it uh, social distancing. It was the variation name. <laughs> Uh, except like, he should be amazing, adding dude. the time to the clock because that's how we all feel at home right now, dude. It was so great. Oh, it was so great. Oh, my God. Uh, anyway, that's been going on. So that is, like I said, 11 a.m. Pacific time throughout the remainder of the week until the finals on Sunday Okay. Um, at fb.gg slash Mortal Kombat. Uh, today, yesterday, and tomorrow are all, like, pro-level players. And then there's going to be content creators playing and then the finals day is actually celebrities i don't know who they're oh, getting but interesting there'll be celebrities okay. involved in some way okay all right when are we when are we running some ultra gen tournaments dude when are we doing this oh yeah that's right we had talked about doing that yeah all right let's chat about that after we get off the air here all right sounds good sounds good i've been uh, anything else uh, what uh, i've been help i've been helping stream some tepin events uh doing that this right. last week uh this last weekend that was one of the reasons why i couldn't play guilty gear one time because i was busy doing that so uh, I, I've been help commentating that. Actually, this time it was me and Chop on the uh, analyst desk, and uh, we had uh, Ninja Nam and Broken Fierce doing the commentary. And wow. Okay. We were we were that's just awesome. analyzing between matches and stuff and talking about like some of the cool stuff that's been going huh. on. It's been really fun. I mean, we've had eight of the best players on four teams playing against each other. There's a ban list and a list of cards that are limited to only one maximum. And so we're ending up with some really interesting decks and stuff. So it's been a lot of fun. It's been really cool. Uh, I'm, Super I've cool. Been, I've been I've been enjoying that. So. Uh, uh, on Thursday night, I streamed the Valley Combat online local, because obviously we can't have the offline one. Mm -hmm. So Shankar still ran that, and we did do round robin still. We probably won't do that ever again, because oh. that took like five hours. We ended up getting more people than usual. <laughs> okay, fair um, enough. So we got other people to play from other regions, including... Uh, Baylina Khan and Mr. Aquaman who hopped in. Oh, cool, cool. And that was cool. You know, I mean, there's they weren't commentating or anything, just right. coming out to play. And that, that was fun. It was just fun to hang out and stream with people for a while. Uh, so, yeah. Probability Distribution asks, where can I see this Teppin at? It's at Teppin underscore community. So Teppin underscore community in Iowa the Boat basically runs that channel. He runs that and his own Iowa the Boat channel. So, and, uh, yeah, and honestly, like, I mean, I don't know if you've been seeing all my updates on Teppin at this point in time. Uh, the best I've gotten to now is 635th in the world. So, you nice. know, yeah, I'm, I'm definitely in there now. I, 
I, I definitely. Let's go, James. Yeah, so uh, I'm using a really cheap deck. I mean, it's super good. But, Isn't everybody at that level? But that's the thing. that I've learned to accept that in CCGs. It's diff very different than fighting games. <laughs> and... Uh, and uh, I've I've finally also uh, I, I got it. I don't know. It's weird. I realize now that I think one of the reasons why I play so badly when I stream Street Fighter Five is that I just play badly with an audience. You remember yeah. Wednesday night fights? I used to play really well, and then I'd go stream and lose every single time. I too remember. That. Um, I mean. I've been stuck at 10,000 forever, like 10,000, 9,700, 10,100, 10, 9,700, back and forth, back and forth. And I swear in like two hours of play where I'm not streaming, I've gotten up to like 1,100 and something or other. And it's just like, I play so much better without people watching me. So I'm actually doing really well in, uh, in Street Fighter V right now, knock nice. on wood. Uh, I really do feel like I have a much better grasp of what Lucia is doing and all that stuff like that. I know I put her in bottom five recently. I don't think she's bottom five. I didn't even think she was really bottom five when I put her down there in the first place. I put her down there and my excuse was bias. That was the reason why I put her in the bottom five. Uh, I really didn't think she was bottom five. I don't think she's great, but she's definitely strong. She's definitely, you know, mid, mid in the game. Yeah, so. that makes sense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Well... Uh, honestly, it's not even just because of the split late. attention when you're playing. It's more just that uh, I've always talked about that when I know people are watching me, then I feel like if I lose, I'm disappointing more than just myself. And I get mm -hmm. really nervous about that way. I still remember one time I was playing Marvel 3 at the run back and ETR was behind me cheering for me. He's like, let's go, James, let's go. And I had to tell him to stop cheering for me <laughs> because it was making me nervous and actually making it harder for me to play because I was like, no, now I'm going to be disappointing him if I lose, you know. <laughs> it's kind of weird. Oh, that makes sense. <sighs> yeah. <clears throat> okay. All righty. Well, you want to call it? Yeah, let's go ahead and call it for the night. So uh, Time thanks. to burn him. Yeah, thanks everybody for tuning in. I hope you guys had a good time and everything like that. Please wash your hands, stay indoors, keep safe everybody, and uh, hope everybody is doing well. Uh, is it? Oh, I had muted the this the, the, the win app. Let me. Thanks uh, to Keats for coming on. That was a great talk. Oh as yeah, always. yeah, absolutely. Thank you to Keats for coming. He's on a there. little smarty pants. Yeah, and he's so articulate too, dude. He's so good at expressing stuff. Because, like, a lot of the stuff that he talks about is stuff that I, I agree with, but every time I say it, it just doesn't come out intelligently at all. So. <laughs> <laughs> all right, everybody. See ya. All right. Peace.